because we have um, to, we want to give Pastor Pam as much time as she needs. Let's go ahead and get started. And I'm going, uh, first of all, welcome to all of you and thank you so very much for signing up, registering for today's um, mission study. I know we will all um, leave feeling that we've been blessed after we've heard Pastor Pam uh, do her presentation today. Uh, I would ask now that you join me in a word of prayer. Merciful Lord, thank you that you are the God of faithfulness. Even when we fail, you never let us down. You have said that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there with them. As we gather together as women today, we are grateful that you are in our midst. In everything we do together, we pray that your eyes would remain on you and we would listen carefully for your voice. To you be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this point, I am going to turn it over to Trudy Jackson, who is the Southeast District Spiritual Growth Coordinator. She has a short devotional and uh, then she will introduce our speaker and we will get started with our program. Trudy. Thank you, thank you. I wanted to start with our mission witness for the week from our prayer calendar. Every breath I take, I am reminded that it was my God and Savior that gave it to me. How I use that breath depends on my ability to act justly in the way that God intended me to be. And Fawn McAllister of Felton, Pennsylvania is the, the person who shared this mission witness this week. Um, our mission focus for today is the new Bethlehem Community Center and it's in Augusta, Augusta Georgia. And this center provides education, food, clothing, services for family, children, senior adults, and at-risk people. Um, and I wanted to um, share our scripture for today. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to go to these scriptures, or you can just listen. Uh, it's from Exodus 19, verses 16 through 25. It's the New International Version. This is at Mount Sinai. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke. And the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up and the Lord said to him, go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord and many of them perish. Even the priest who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against him. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us. Put limits around mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priest and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. And our second, um, second verses are from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 8. And this is the transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, they were so frightened. 
Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And I know we probably won't gather together before Easter, so I wanted to share a, a short Easter prayer with you, if you'd bow with me. The veil of darkness transformed to the brightest light. The most dreadful end became the most beautiful beginning. The depths of despair fade to reveal hope everlasting. The curse of death defeated by eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for the wonder of Easter. And at this time, it is my privilege and honor to introduce our speaker today. Upon finishing her studies at the Boston University School of Theology, Pastor Pam Estes, has served in Arkansas United Methodist Churches since 1989. Before serving back home, she taught in Missouri, Arkansas, and Tennessee, and worked in libraries in Arkansas, Tennessee, and Massachusetts. She loves UMW because if it were not for the women, clergy women would not have had the opportunity to serve, God, serve as God has called. She has taught numerous Bible and mission studies in her own congregations for UMW and for the School of Mission, Mission U. Please join me in welcoming Pam Estes to our meeting. Thank you so much. I, I am just delighted to be with you, even though it's technology. Uh, the, these are interesting times in which we live. And uh, I frequently give thanks for the marvels of technology. I hope everybody, I usually pray, Lord, may all of our internet be stable. Uh, <laughs> we need that. Um, Betty asked if we wanted to do introductions. We're gonna do an exercise in a few minutes that will, will get us all acquainted across the board, if we will. Let me ask a few preliminary questions. How many of you have already read the book Practicing uh, Resurrection, the Gospel of Mark, or have studied it elsewhere. All right, Kathy, let me get to my second screen. Anybody else? Susan, Gretchen, okay. Um, and how many of you who have not read it do have a copy? Okay, good. Well, uh, you do have your Bible with you. That's good, right? And you do have some paper and pencil because always you're going to write things down because it will be so profound that you will want to remember it. Um, I, I should have asked Betty and Trudy if, if they wanted to record this. Um, we record a, a Bible study that I do on, on uh, Wednesday mornings. And it's, it's really interesting to me that, that there are people out there who don't have anything uh, else to do but but go to Facebook and watch stuff or YouTube, but. We are recording it and we'll make it available on our Facebook page. Oh, wonderful. Okay, well in that case, everybody remember, this is, you're, you're on forever, all right? So I'll, I'll, I'll remember that too, because there are sometimes on occasion things that I say that I wouldn't want everybody to know. Um, because United Methodist women understand things differently than some of the rest of the world. But let me reiterate again, how much I appreciate you United Methodist women, and I see that we have people here from not only the Southeast District, which is the sponsor, but from the Southwest District, and Kathy McKinney, where do you live? You're not, what district are you in? It's going to be Northeast. Northeast. Northeast, that's what I thought, so. Uh, we oh, and Carolyn is also in the Northeast District. And uh, we have every district. Well, Kathy Blackwell, Northwest. Do we have anybody from Central District? No. No? All right. Well, uh, just as a little advertisement, next month I will be doing the uh, upcoming study for the Southwest District. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Good. So, hmm. all right. So the purpose of this study. I am. Yes, Vicki. Sorry. Um, I, Becky Simmons just texted me and said she's having difficulty getting on and that she, I don't know how we can help her from this end, but she's having difficulty getting on. And I just wanted y'all to know in case there was something, something could, somebody could do. Okay. Who's, who's hosting today? Betty or? Yes. Betty. Okay. I'll call her and see. Thank you, Becky. 
appreciate Hello. that. Can you hear me? This is yeah. Becky. Oh, she did get on. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Sorry. We can Bye. hear you. Becky's on by phone. All right. By phone. Hey, Becky. Welcome. Thank you. All right. United Methodist women, we don't just study the Bible because we're interested in it with our heads. We always have a, a larger purpose. And as Janet Wolf states in this book, the purpose of this study is, first of all, to encounter Jesus in a specific intentional way as liberator. And then to respond to the call from that liberating Jesus to a transformative learning discipleship, which will result in faithful following and serving God in the world so that the shalom realm of God will appear. Now that, that's, that's a big thing, but I think it's doable. Uh, it probably would be helpful if everybody mutes unless they're going to speak. And I will try to make sure that we all get an opportunity to speak. Okay. So that's the purpose. Um, and in that purpose, we have to set aside some of the things that we have always known or that we've always thought were true. So let's begin with a wonderful poem, poem prayer from the book itself, Ted Loder, uh, Ted Loder, L-O-D-E-R, um, is a, a poet prayer uh, he has many, many books, and, and I, I recommend them to you. One is, uh, I think, called Gorillas of Grace. But this is a pray prayer entitled Crazed into Holy Awareness. That's one of the things that we will stri strive for today is to, to find in ourselves and in our faith communities, wherever they are, a holy awareness. So pray. Come, Lord Jesus, confront me as a prophet disturb my indifference, expose my practiced phoniness, shatter my brittle certainties, deflate my arrogant sophistries, and craze me into a holy awareness of my common humanity, and so of my bony, bloody need to love mercy, do justly, and walk humbly with you and with myself. Trusting that whatever things it may be too late for, prayer is not one of them, nor a chance, nor change, nor passion, nor laughter, nor starting yet again to risk a way to be together, nor a wild, far-sighted claim that this human stuff of yours is stronger still than fail or time, graced to share a kingdom and spirited for joy. Amen. So we, we evoke that spirit of prayer to help us meet the purpose. Uh, Professor Ted Jennings uh, died last year. Wonderful, wonderful scholar. Did a lot of writing for uh, those who were interested in full inclusion in the world. Taught for many years in Mexico uh, as a United Methodist, United States citizen, and then later uh, here in the States, <clears throat> he asks a question in our book that I want us to reflect for a few minutes on. Now, before I give you the question, let me remind you, we have in our Bible, uh, how many gospels? Hold up your fingers. How many gospels do we have? We have four gospels. That's exactly right. And three of them are, are much more alike than they are different. John is the different one. The others are called synoptics. We remember that the synoptics are called that, and I'm going to ask somebody to show off their great knowledge. This is like Jeopardy. I'm looking across, or what was that other show where they were all they were all across the screen? Anybody have an answer? What does the synoptics What does synoptic mean? Unmute yourself and speak up. Don't be shy. Oh, come now, scholars. Pam, does it mean the summary? Okay. Say again. Say again. Same. Same. Yes, that's 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 part of what it means. And a short summary or a summary of what was said. Ah, that would be a synopsis. Yes, very good. Right, very good. 
we call the three gospels matthew martin luke synoptics because sin s-y-n means with and optics means seeing so the three gospels see the good news of jesus together they are with one another in commonality right and so whenever we look at a gospel text one of the questions we ask is you can't even hear me i got muted for some moment where did i go off synoptic means see with the three that are common frequently have the same stories but they are often presented in slightly different ways and those differences are important because they reflect a community of faith now i'll suggest to you that you wherever you are across the state whether you're in a larger church or a smaller church or whether you've been a united methodist for a long time your faith community has its own uh, kind of gospel it's the scripture that you always default to it's the scripture that you find yourself referring to most frequently the gospels come out of that kind of faith experience all right so having said that as background here's Ms. here's professor uh jennings question if all you had was the little gospel of mark try to imagine this all you have is those short 16 chapters of the gospel of mark nothing else in the new testament what would you know about jesus what would you know about jesus just from the gospel of mark now perhaps you haven't read the gospel of mark in in its entirety uh recently so that may be a challenging question so maybe we, we can proceed the question with this let's all think of one a uh, characteristic or aspect of Jesus that always comes to your mind, something about Jesus that is essential. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call on you and I'm gonna start with telephone number 870-847-0711. Tell us who you are, please. Are you there and unmute? No, maybe not. All right, let's go to Danny's iPad. Who is Danny's iPad? Can you unmute and tell us something about Jesus? No, maybe not. Gretchen Diffie, are you still there? I am, I'm here. All right, tell us something that you, a characteristic of Jesus, please. Love. Love, all right. That seems like a pretty good one characteristic of of jesus thank you barbara barbara tell me who you are barbara okay i'm barbara from saint james saint marks wonderful what what uh characteristic of jesus would you name for us forgiveness forgiveness okay Kathy Blackwood. Um, I would probably say not afraid to challenge authority figures or some of the rules that authority figures put out there. Could I say that fearless in, in the face of authority? Yeah, that's good. Okay. All right. Carol Wilson. Well, you're still muted. There we go. He, he is a healer. A healer. All right. Thank you, Carolyn. Carol. Carol it is. All right. Uh, let's see. Vaughn's iPhone. Vaughn. Look, you're still muted, sweetie. Uh, I would say servant. Servant. Okay, good. Thank you, Vaughn. Uh, Joe Morrison. Pure of heart. Pure of heart. Uh -huh. Okay. Pacola. 
Merciful. Merciful. All right. Zoe Hines, how are things in Sheridan? They're wonderful and caring. Caring? All right. Uh, Amy, is Gabby back from breakfast yet? No, she's still hanging out with daddy, but um, I would say miracle worker. Miracle worker. All right. Evelyn? Evelyn still with us? Did I make up that there was an Evelyn here? No, I was muted. I'm sorry. This is Evelyn. This is Evelyn from Holly Methodist in Pine Bluff. Oh, uh, okay. I was going to say he's empathetic. You know, he he could uh, he can sympathize with everybody and understand everybody. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Helen Emerson. Ellen Emerson. We'll get her in a minute. And then uh, Helen's iPad is a different person. I don't know who that is. Uh, this, this is Helen in Monticello First Methodist. Oh, okay. And, and he, he, is that mine? Go ahead. We're listening to uh, He teaches in parable. Teaches in parable. All right. He, he teaches did. us terrible. Okay. Teacher of parables. Uh, Sarah Beth Maxwell. Son of God, son of man. Son of God and son of man. Right. Man. Man. Uh huh. Uh, Brenda Wright. There she is. Here I am. I was I was going to say he taught parables and somebody oh, took that yeah. one. Oh, so right. I'm going to say he was kind. He showed us how to be kind, strong, and kind. Strong and kind. All right. Thank you, Brenda. And Brenda, where are you from? Oh, Monticello. Monticello. First Church, Monticello. Monticello. All right. Good. Good. Uh, may I say this, Pastor Pam? Lori Fallon is my daughter. That's right. See, I I, I knew I knew who you really were. Well, I, I didn't know, but I wanted to, I'm so proud of her, you know, I just wanted to mention that. You're the children's, uh, your children's ministry. Well, yes, ministry coordinator. Yes, thank you. I am. Okay. All right, good deal. It's good to know what people, who people are, how they're connected, and sometimes what they do. Yes. Uh, Helen's iPad. Oh, no. I'm bad no. on, no, she oh. spoke to Helen Emerson. Uh, Helen Emerson? Uh, yes. Are you oh, there? Sure. Okay, I, now I'm back. I couldn't Good. figure out how to unmute my phone. <laughs> life is life is full of challenges, and we meet. Them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I would say he's compassionate. Compassionate. All right. Thank you very much. Good to I hear from you. I was going to say compassionate and caring, but uh, uh, Joe said caring. So that's all right. We can we can repeat ourselves. Now, Michael Wilson isn't really Michael Wilson. Unmute. Unmute, please. Who are you really up there? <coughs> You're in my right hand corner. Carolyn Wilson. That's what I thought. Yes. I was going to say he teaches in parables. Okay. Um, but uh, he was a great teacher a and great he was a, a father figure. Okay. All right. Now let's see. Margaret Carlo. Having some audio difficulties. Sandra Turner, will you be ready? We get we'll come back to Margaret. Sandra. Well, I'm getting towards the end of the 
that feedback <laughs> is getting to me. Um, I wouldn't say it in, an, in a bad way, but he was, um, and I can't think of the word for it, but indignant on the behalf of the, the downtrodden. Yes, he, he had righteous indignation about the oppressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, he was a table flipper, is I think what you're, perhaps, are you thinking of? Yeah, right. table flipper, all right, now let's see. Uh, Laura Nixon, it's good to see you. Do you have anything you'd like to say? Uh, loving. Loving. All right. Thank you. Where did I, there she is. All right. Now. And let's see. Pat. I don't know who Pat is. See if we can get her. Cal Hopper in CrossFit. All right. And do you have another another image or characteristic to add to our list? Available. Available. Oh, that's wonderful. Marvelous. Okay. Now let's see. Becky. Is there a Becky here? Becky, 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 Becky. No, where did I come up with Becky? Okay. Uh, Vicki? Becky's here now. I'm oh, thinking, okay, okay. Becky, let her answer. Okay, go ahead, Becky. I'm on my iPad and I don't know how to do Zoom on iPad, but uh, I was going to say uh, strong and courageous. <laughs> okay, strong and courageous. All right, now we'll go to Vicki. I, immediately when you asked the question, holy came to my mind. Uh huh. Holy, uh -huh. you know, the second head of the Trinity. Yeah, yeah, okay. Not, not just a man. All right. Now, let's see. I haven't called on Betty Cook. Charitable. Charitable. And uh, Ann West. Promise keeper. Promise keeper. Oh, good. All right. And Judy. Judy on an iPhone. Um. Yes. What was the question? <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I've been. I was distracted. I had other things to take oh, care of. Judy. 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 <laughs> Well, you can't see. You can't see me do that. So it's. I, okay. You know what? I I would know your voice anywhere. <laughs> just okay. to hear you. So what is the question? The question, Judy, is what is a characteristic of Jesus that immediately comes to your mind? Bold. Bold. See now, we could we could go back and do a whole study on why each of you named the thing you named. And now I've saved Charlotte McKeever. Is that correct? McKeever? That's correct. Okay. And I say, Jesus radiates. Radiates. What does Jesus radiate, Charlotte? Love. Love. His whole aura. Uh-huh. Love. Yeah. Okay. You know who he is when you see him. Yes. Okay. And let hmm, me I don't know about that. Double check my list here. Oh, yeah. There's that Bonnie Adcox. Down there in Mongolia. She's really in Magnolia. Yes, Bonnie, First Church Magnolia. I would say that he was a chooser and a sender. He chose his disciples, he sent them out. Hey, would you would you give um oh Ann Gurley's daughter, my love? I saw I will. Carol, yes. Carol, yeah. I will. I, she's not on Facebook, and so uh, and Ann Gurney died at the ripe age of ninety-nine. A wonderful, wonderful woman, always serving her church and did it with great joy. So, all right, has everybody had a chance to share? Then, now I hope you noticed as we went through this list that with hey, um, yes, oh, I'm sorry, Paula. It's the very last person. <laughs> 
I'm sorry, I didn't have you written down on my list and that's that's great. Okay, I had a feeling. That, um, I thought of teacher, uh -huh. for, but then, you know, everybody else did too, so. Well, <clears throat> there are reasons that we have common okay. things that come to our mind, but what- that's, Sorry, Pastor Pam, Gabby's yes. here. She has oh, one. Good. Hey, Gabby, girl, it is so good to see you. Hi. Hi. Um, what, would, what would you tell us? Friend. Friend. Okay, what a friend we have in Jesus. Marvelous. Well, another? I have one. Okay. Giver of grace. Giver of grace. Grace giver. I'm sorry, Trudy, I had written down by your name that you were the spiritual growth coordinator and I thought I'd already called on you. Okay. And you teach at Drew Central Elementary? Yes, ma'am. What a great little school. It is. Marvelous history. All right. Now, uh, I taught last fall for the course of study, which is a school that we, we ask our part-time local pastors to go to, which is how I first got acquainted with uh, Brenda Wright's daughter, Lori Fallon, a year earlier. Um, and we had to go to Zoom. And it was quite an interesting experience because um, I didn't know anything about doing Zoom except just turning it on and putting my face in the screen. And here we are a year later, and I, I have to confess, I have not advanced to screen sharing and dropping things in and all that sort of stuff. It's on my list. It's on my list, but I've been occupied with other things. So that's my apology. Now, those of you who have been in studies with me before know that <clears throat> I, I can't, I don't sit down to teach. I stand up and walk around and get right up to you and ask you a question. And then we do things in small groups. And this study in particular calls for lots of activities where we would turn to one another and then we would turn to somebody else. And I know that many of you, Vicki uh, has been in my studies and I know what a good participant she is in that and Kathy McKinney and uh, Bonnie and Amy and Gabby and you know many of you, we can't do that. And they asked me if I wanted us to set up um, breakout groups. And I said, no, I've been in some things with those and I don't like them. So we're just gonna, <laughs> that's just all there is to it. I don't like them. I like to be able to see as many of you as I can. So stretch your screen out to as full as you can and put it on gallery view. And then you'll notice that we have two screens full of people. Now when, uh, and I don't understand how Zoom puts us on these screens. But when you go from screen to screen, some of the people who are on the first screen end up on the second screen too. So you're not seeing double, it's just the way they do it. So if we were together, one of the things we would have done was to have put all those names up on the, on the board and then we would have circled them around to see how they all come together. And we would have noticed that what we emphasize are characteristics of, of Jesus with which we resonate. Our, our, our own spiritual place tends to make us focus on, on one of those aspects. One of the things this study asks us to do is to recognize a little bit more deeply who we are. And that's called social location, all right? Social location means who you are from a, ver a variety of places. One of the things that we as United Methodists are struggling with, but we are working on it, is how to address the issues of racism and violence and um, the divisiveness that has occurred in the last uh, five or so years, as well as the struggles we have through this pandemic. It's hard to be loving and kind to people that you can't even give, give a, a loving touch to. Uh, it's, it's hard to show love just with your eyes behind a mask, isn't it? But God is teaching us something wonderful. You didn't have to travel to get to this meeting today. And wasn't that nice? You could stay in bed a little longer. <laughs> and you know what snacks you want, right? So we had a Board of Ordained Ministry meetings this last uh, couple of weeks. And we all commented on how the advantage was nobody had to travel. And usually we have to travel from the four corners of the state to Conway, which is a central point. We didn't have to do that. And for people who are watching 
what they eat. They didn't have to resist what Nancy Meredith puts out for us, which is always wonderfully sweet and caloric, but also healthy too. But the one thing we said we missed was actually being able to perceive one another from more than our heads, right? Because you as United Methodist women know maybe better than others, God has made us as embodied souls. Your body is an important part of who you are, right? It locates you in the universe physically, right? That's part of your social location, how you might even describe your body. So what we're gonna do is I wanna ask you to make note and I'll, I'll name off these categories. Usually when we're together, I don't give you the categories and we just, we wait and see what people turn up with. But today we're gonna do it this way, all right? So first, uh, write down your name, all right? Write down your name, what your name is. Now you notice in my, in my little Zoom frame, I'm Pamela Jean Estes. Now I can change that. I think I know how to do that. You, you click on it and, mm -hmm. and you can change it, but I'm not gonna change it. But sometimes I'm not Pamela Jean Estes. Uh, sometimes I'm Pastor Pam Estes. I am never Pamela J Estes. It's very important. I'm either the whole thing or part of it, right? I'm, you call me Pam. You can even call me Pammy June. I, that's what my great aunt used to call me. That's not my name, but put your name down. Then, What's your citizenship status? Where do you live? Now in where you live, do you live in, a, in an apartment, a house, a condo? Do you live with other people or by yourself? What is your gender, your age? Oh, I'm so glad I'm 67 and a half, almost three quarters. Thankful that, that Governor Hutchinson lowered the age to 65 so I could get my COVID vaccine. Education. Now there are the next two, am I going too fast? The next two are related, race and ethnicity. Race and ethnicity. Okay. I don't know what that is. Well, we, we'll, we'll come around to it. <laughs> family, family of origin. That's the sort of thing that says, okay, uh, I am the fourth daughter of five of of parents who are still married to each other or who were or who were divorced or whatever. Okay, understand that? Economic status. Marital status. Now, Laura, you put down single. That's what we are. But not only are, are we single, we're, we are probably single, uh, never married, not likely to marry. Laura and I are smart. <laughs> no, we're not. Sexual identity. Primary language. Physical abilities. Limited. <laughs> All right. You know what? I'm not. Now here's the hard one. Here's some hard ones. Now we're going to go back and look at that list. Put a check mark by any of those things that give you privilege, power, or status in your location. So, you understand the question? The things that give you privilege, power, and status. Many of us don't wake up in the morning and say to ourselves, oh, I am a citizen of the United States of America. 
But imagine for a moment, if you were a person who lived in the city where you are, who was not a citizen of the United States, how, how would your life be different? What would be different about what you do because you are not a citizen of the United States? Anybody want to share? You run the risk of discrimination because of your nationality, especially in these days, uh, Asian Americans tend to be discriminated against and, and um, the victim of hate crimes very often. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so you've named that sometimes you might appear not to be a citizen and be discriminated against. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Although it would be possible that you are a citizen. I'm thinking about Brenda Wright's granddaughter is uh, by birth Korean and she is living in a family of uh, white people, but she goes to school in Monticello where other people might perceive that she was foreign, which she is foreign, but she is a citizen of the United States. Okay. Anybody else? I think many people live in fear. Uh, we have a, not a large Hispanic population, but we do have uh, about 6% of our school and many of those families are, are not here legally. So they live in fear. Now, some of those people are in families where some people are illegal mm -hmm. present and mm -hmm. others are citizens. Right, the, the children usually are citizens because they were born here. Right, in Pine Bluff, we had the case of uh, three groups. We had the dreamers, the ones who were, who were brought here as children small, who had never lived really in, in uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And so that's, so if you are here and you don't have citizenship, that that's a difficult that's a difficulty yeah okay what else does being a citizen of the united states give you in terms of privilege and power let's think beyond you know, our, our american life. citizens um have an ability to move around i don't travel a lot outside the country but to move around the world with the expectation that they will be protected by their citizenship and their embassy in a way that I don't think is as true for many other citizens of many other countries. Okay, good, thank you, Kathy. And also, if you wanted to move to Texas, I don't know why you would want to, but if you wanted to move to Texas, you don't have to get a visa to move to Texas. We, we have the freedom of movement within our country. And we, we sometimes take that for granted as well. All right. So that's- Oh, I'm unmuted. May I make a comment on our previous question? Yes, certainly. I grew up in Texas. And uh, even when I was a kid, there were a lot of people of um, Latino descent. Mm -hmm. And the thing that amazed me was that people who had lived here their whole lives, their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents had been in what is now Texas before it was even part of the United States, still carried their birth certificates in their wallets to be able to prove that they were U.S. citizens. So the thing of not appearing white, you know, mm -hmm. um, can be a form of discrimination as well. Thank you, Kathy. Excellent point. Um, excellent point. Okay, geographic location. Where you live, is that is that a place of privilege and power? If you live if if you live in Monticello, are you superior to the people who live in Stuttgart? Judy's, Judy's going, no. <laughs> uh, Sam, I'm not. Go ahead. Um, I, I would 
say that in this period of time with COVID and vaccines, that being in the United States certainly puts us at the front of the line. It, it's a privilege, getting our privilege of access to, to the vaccine. Yeah. Pam. Yes. Uh, I live in Hot Springs Village, and a lot of people think that we are privileged because we live here, but we also have a lot of people in the village that need help. You're not all rich white folks? No, ma'am. So even though Hot Springs Village is the largest gated community in the United States, it is not a singularly identified group. Correct. And everybody isn't, isn't from outside of Arkansas. Correct. Okay, good. Thank you for that. We're definitely not all rich. Well, we'll get to richness in a moment here. So hold, hold that thought, Joe, okay? Um, what about the place, the actual physical location where you put your head on a pillow at night? Is that a, is that a privilege, a power or a status? People are nodding. I would say yes, because we, you know, we have a, a home, a, a building to live in. Mm -hmm. We're not on the street. Yeah. You also have some areas of city where you don't want to be out after dark. And if you don't live in one of those areas, you're more secure. So there's that, that peace of mind that you live in a safe location where there's not gang activity or, you know, something else. Uh-huh. Okay. Is it better to live? I in know that. Excuse me. Go ahead, Vicky. I, I don't want to talk over you, but um, I think this was brought home to me. We live in the rural outside of Pine Bluff. Mm -hmm. um, it's not way down in the country. A highway goes down in front of our house, but we are off of the road, back away from the road. And I remember whenever we brought our first um, exchange student home, he lived in Panama. And when we were pulling off of the highway to go down our long driveway to our house, his eyes were as big as saucers. Uh -huh. And, and I, he could not, his English wasn't great enough to be able to express what he was thinking, but he could not believe he was gonna be able to live in this home for this period of time. Mm -hmm. And of course we are very modest, very mm -hmm. modest. You know, but we had land around us and, and it was not a big piece of land, but land. Yeah. And it, it, to me, it really came home to me. I have no idea what his home looked like or where he was from or what kind of conditions he lived in, but I could see on his face that this wasn't it. <laughs> Thank you, Vicki. Anybody else want to share? Anybody live in a in a small apartment that they really like? I have a couple of friends who would like to downsize. In fact, I, I know some people who have downsized. And what they discover is they don't miss all the stuff that they don't have anymore. Right? Now, those you you all know me well enough to know I do have a few books. If I could turn the, the screen or the camera around and show you, there are a few here. Uh, <clears throat> a few years ago, when I was in Pine Bluff, Laura Nixon was was the co-worker uh, with the youth. One of the youth said, Pastor Pam, during Lent, you need to not just give up buying books; you need to give away books. And so, uh, over the course of of several years, I have given away and given away and given away. And last year, I, 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 I felt so proud of myself that I had actually made net loss, you know, because you do buy and then you give away. But I don't know, this year it's not looking real good. But in any case, I take as privilege that I live in a parsonage. And uh, Gretchen, do you live in a parsonage now? Or do you all have your own house? We, we live in a parsonage. Okay, so that's a different experience, isn't it, Gretchen? Yes. And we don't, we're not gonna make you say anything more about it. Um, <laughs> when I moved into the parsonage here in Little Rock, there was not very much furniture. And you know, you good Methodists, that there are requirements for what's supposed to be in 
the uh, parsonage. It's supposed to be furnished with two bedrooms of furniture, living room furniture. Uh, and this particular parsonage didn't have any beds, but I had a bed, thankfully, one, one bed. And um, if you were come to come and visit me, you, you would say, well, it's a good thing they didn't have any furniture because you filled this sucker up. That's privilege. Being able to have stuff is privilege. And it, and it, um, it reflects on what, how we look at other people and where they're located. Okay, enough of that. Now, um, gender. Pam, may I make a comment? Sure, Kathy. Um, I think probably the biggest part of privilege I feel for where I live is that I have a safe place where I can go and totally be myself and not worry about what anybody else is thinking, what example I might be making for anybody else <laughs> for a period of time, almost every day. Ah, so your, your housing allows you solitude. Yes. Is that what you're yeah. I, yeah. I'm married. My, my husband is here most of the time, but it's, it's not a place where a lot of other people come. Uh -huh. And... I find that comforting. Now, we do invite mm -hmm. like people occasionally, but I find it comforting to be in my own space. And there's a great deal of safety and security that comes from that. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's privilege, whether it's an apartment or a house, but in our case, we're on three of them. So, for those of you who didn't grow up as one of eight to 13 or 14 children, most of us have not experienced the kind of uh, numbers of people in a house at a time that other people in the world have as normative. Am I right? Yeah, and that is a dip, that's, that's a kind of privilege. Now, some people who grew up with lots of people in their house would say it was a privilege to them to live in a three generation house with a household full of people. So it's not just one side, one side or the other. All right. Now, is it good to be female in, in your location? Is it a privilege? Do you have power and status because you're female? Sandra's laughing. <laughs> I'm glad I live in America for the reason that I am now widowed and single as a female. Mm -hmm. uh, other countries, females don't have any power. Yes. So. Yes. And, and thank you, Joe, for, for clarifying that your, your uh, marital status is widow. And then you said single. My experience is that those of you who are widows think of yourselves as widows primarily and not as singles. There's a, there's a difference between a, a not yet married, a never married, um, divorced and uh, widowed. And I even have some friends who, who were divorced and then their ex-husband died and that made them widows because they really were then, then widows. So, okay, thank you. All right, uh, age. Okay, we're gonna start with who I think is the youngest. Gabby, are you 16? No. Not it's, yet? It's, so I'm, I'm 14. I have one oh. more month and I'm 15 then. One more month and you'll be 15. So I think it's safe to say you're the youngest here. Do you have, yeah. do you have an advantage by being 15 in the world that you live in? Is it, is it a good thing to be 15, almost 15? I don't, I don't know. Well, in the household, she, you know, in the household, I mean, you know, she, she does have an advantage there because she's the only child. Yes. So... You know, there is a lot of focus on making sure that she has everything she needs for education, making sure that uh, we have our ducks in a row for in case something happens to us that she's taking care of in her future. Uh huh. You know, so there's that. Yeah. Now, are you a sophomore in high school? No, she's a freshman. How I keep making her be older because she's so tall. She's tall. Yes. She's tall. Okay. So our ninth graders. Are ninth graders important at high school? 
I'm online, so I don't know. I don't she's, know. She's doing all virtual school. So. Oh, it's all virtual, so it's really hard to tell. I don't know. Well, okay, right. we're, we're she's camped in front of a computer. I have to figure something out. Places, and we're all going to tell you that we remember being in the ninth grade, right? And if yeah. you were in ninth grade and you were in a school where it was ninth through 12, you were at the bottom mm -hmm. of the totem pool. Oh, oh yes, yeah, very much so. When I was in the ninth grade. It was junior high, seven, eighth, and ninth. And I'm telling you, ninth graders, we were hot stuff. And then the next year, we found out, boom, we were at the bottom. Right? Yep. Okay. Do you all remember everybody except for Gabby turning 21? And what yeah, was it so wonderful about being 21? absolutely nothing changed for me i i don't drink so it didn't matter at all right okay and you're all you're uh you're young enough that you'd already registered to vote at 18 so now i'm going to back yes, ma'am do you all who are over 60 remember when the uh right to vote was dropped to 18 now bonnie and i are the same age except she's a little older than i am bonnie did you go register to vote when you were when, on your 18th birthday? No, not until I was 20. I went, and, uh, but that was the reason that I, my parents didn't vote. And so I wasn't encouraged to do that until I got married. And oh. so at 20, at 20, I went to register to vote and voted then at age 20. Okay. So you got your marriage license and then your voting license. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I went to, I went to register to vote on my 18th birthday. I was so psyched, right? Because the year before, when it when what year that, well anyway, there was a there was a guy in my in in our town in Arkadelphia who, as soon as he had heard the legislation had passed, went down to the courthouse, and he said, "I'm here to register to vote," and they said, "Let's see your driver's license." And he was just 18, and they said, "You can't register to vote. You have to be 21." He says, "No, no, no. We passed the rule. We passed the rule." Well, they didn't believe him. Courthouse employees didn't know. So he, he stood there and insisted that they call somebody until somebody figured it out that, well, yeah, he's right. So Bill Fuller was the first 18-year-old uh, to register to vote in Arkadelphia at Clark County. And I, always imp I was impressed by that because it's a privilege to get to vote. And it is a privilege that women deeply we should appreciate because uh, we, had to, we had to let the men tell us that we could have that right. And as we celebrate women's suffrage, we also want to remember, because it's important to know the whole story, that when women got the right to vote, it wasn't women, it was white women. And African-American women and, and Asian-Americans uh, and Native Americans didn't get it to even later. So when we talk about having the privilege to vote, let's, let's remember how that, how that spread out. And that's, that's an important aspect. Some of us are old enough that we remember buying a poll tax so that we could vote. Yeah, there was no register to vote. You had to go pay in order to vote, which kept lots of people from getting to do that. But do you uh, remember how much it cost there are you? All of us out here who remember it. Pardon? Do you remember how much that poll tax? What cost? did you say? How much did, was the poll? One dollar. One dollar. A dollar when I bought my first one. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Hmm. Well. Well, so. I'm with Bonnie. I got my marriage license, then I registered to vote. Uh huh. Well, interesting. Okay. Well, that's a that's a privilege to get. Yes, to vote. it is. And uh, in in these times, we don't want to take it for granted. Okay. Well, Pastor, oh, I'm, I'm old enough that. You had to be 21 to vote. Uh huh. When I registered, and the day I turned 21, I went and registered to vote. And I, I remember voting my first presidential election, and uh, I didn't vote for Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 So let me, let me ask the question of age. When you turn 62, it, uh, you could go on. on um, uh, what can you start taking? Social Security retirement, if you choose to, right? Or you could choose not to and take it at 65, right? And now to take it, we have to be, um, how, old, how old do we have to be now to take it? Uh, those of us who were born in the 50s, it's older than 65. I think it's something like 
67 and so many months or something. Anyway, I'm not going to take it because I'm not going to retire. But in any case, I can say I appreciate the privilege when I turn 65 of getting to do what? Medicare. Medicare. My insurance costs went down 50%. 50%. It was amazing, right? What a privilege. We, we mustn't take that for granted either. And there are some people who don't have the privilege of knowing that they have that privilege. Some people don't know that they have that privilege and don't get it. All right, so that's, uh, so is it good to be over 70? Is there anybody here who's over 70 who would like to testify? Yes, ma'am. Okay, go ahead. Tell us what's good about being over 70. Who was that? Who was that masked woman? Who said it was good to be over 70? Well, it wasn't me, but I will say that the only benefit I've found so far is we got our shots first. (laughs) The rest of it is just a lot of numbers that don't matter, you know? I mean, you know. Age is just a number. Yeah. As long as you're in health, in good health, yeah. Yeah, okay. Are, are there, are there, yes, go ahead, Zoe. This is, this is so, I just add, um, I'm over 70, and um, it's just an advantage to be able to be over 70. <laughs> wow, I can't believe you're 70. Golly, wow. I'm, I'm over 70. <laughs> are, you, are you still working, Zoe? A couple of years, and yes, I am still working every day, all day. Now, that's a privilege too, right? Uh, I think it is, yes. Some don't, but yes, I do think it is. Because some people, some people, when they reach certain ages, have mandatory retirement. Correct. When I hit 72 under our current book of discipline, I will, I will be forcibly officially retired. Now, that doesn't mean I can't continue to be appointed, but I will no longer be guaranteed an appointment. But until 72, they have to put me someplace. So interesting, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Okay. So age, age, age is something. Another of Zoe's advantages of being over 70 is she has two beautiful granddaughters, and one of them, who is now eight years old, is our youngest UMW member. Oh boy. Abby, you got beat out, honey. Eight years old. That I'm is good. Fine by that. Yay, <laughs> Gabby's not the youngest in the state. Yay. That's good. Well, she's been the youngest for a long time. Okay, so age, age does have in some some ways disadvantage, whether if you're young or old. Sometimes it has advantage. Are there some groups of people who um, have more respect for people over? Uh, for what we call women of a certain age, or are there groups where you feel like uh, women of a certain age are um, not held in such high esteem? Pam. Yes. When I was 65, I went to Uganda, actually Uh a little, and the median age there is 15. So we were, um, I went on a mission, kind of a mission trip but we one day we went to a rainforest and we were walking and all the younger people were slipping down but when they found out how old I was I had a person on each side of me and one behind me in case I fell that's respect for age it is because they don't know many people that age wow 15 is the median age yes what they need the wisdom of the elder Right. Well, it was because of war. So yeah, yeah. Well, war is hurt, hurt, hurt. Okay. Thank uh, you for sharing that. Pam, mm-hmm. I, a lot of different cultures have a greater respect for their elders. Hispanic uh, families, Asian families, they take care of their elders and they bring them in the home. You know, our culture, we put them in the nursing home. So mm-hmm. it's, it's quite different. They have a, a real, real respect for their elders and, and the wisdom they have. Yeah. Yep. Well, most, uh, the last statistic I saw on this, most people in the United States 
live in their own homes until they die, the majority. And uh, this would again be a place of privilege. Um, right now, my mother, uh, who is widowed since June, is living in the home she li has lived in since she and my father built it in 1966. She is able to do that for two reasons. One is because my sister's crazy and she's moved from Michigan with her husband because they can work virtually uh, on the computer and uh, they have moved in to help take care of my mother. And because my mother has Medicare, which pays for home health care, we benefit from that, right? And again, there are other people who don't know how to, how to benefit from that, who don't have the resources or who live in places where there aren't people who are willing to work in the ways that these marvelous healthcare workers do for my mother. So those are things of, of privilege that we have as well. Um, and it does, it does show respect for, for us when we are able to keep our elders in their homes. But when we, when we, and they find they have to be in nursing homes, it doesn't mean we don't love them. It just means that's, that's the best care that we can give them. Well, and that's true because my own mother did have to go to the nursing home because she became immobile. So that, uh, you know, not out of disrespect, but just out of necessity. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, okay. Um, all right, so now we're gonna go to education. And I'm gonna ask you this, how many of you wrote down on education the letters that represent a degree? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. And um, how many of you wrote down something else to describe your education? Anybody write anything besides? Sandra, what'd you write down? I'm curious. Post back, I, I took three semesters post a uh, bachelor's degree. Okay, so you have a bachelor's and, and, and courses beyond. And that's what you wrote down. Okay. Did, did, did anybody write down self-educated? Um, anybody here have a parent or grandparent who didn't complete uh, high school? Okay. It used to be that people didn't go to school for a long time, right? Um, I had a grandfather who uh, only finished, I think, the eighth grade. My other, my other grandparents finished high school. Um, do we assume now that everybody should have a college education or a, a, a diploma from a tech school? Is that our presumption of privilege? Do we behave in ways that we that we don't even realize that we are privileging the fact that people have education? Are you following me on this? Okay. When, when you think about that granddaughter, Zoe, you assume she's gonna go to college, don't you? We just assume these things. Kathy Blackwell's got this great good looking kid. What, what to, where is he in college now, Kathy? He is now a junior at U of A. And he's in engineering? Computer engineering. Compute, not just engineering, computer engineering. Computer. He's smart. Mm -hmm. So now there's a privilege that this boy has. Why can't I remember his name? I apologize. Jeff. Jeff. Jeff is an Eagle Scout, right? Do you all know Eagle Scouts? Are they better than other people? I tell you what, if I was gonna look around in my church for somebody that I wanted to have something get done, I'd look for people, I'd look for the men who've been Eagle Scouts. And in the church I serve in, we this chapter that's associated with us, we've had more Eagle Scouts than anybody else in the state, <laughs> right? So um, Eagle Scouts, demonstrate certain things that give them access to privilege and power. Because if a kid puts on his resume, Eagle Scout, other Eagle Scouts say, oh, okay, he's one of us, right? He's one of us. 
But there are ways to be educated that go beyond formal education. And one of the things that, that I think would be helpful for us is to consider how people are educated in things other than book learning and how, how that is a, a faithful expression of God's grace in their, in, in their lives, okay? Just think on that. All right, race and ethnicity. I'll show you. I'm white, right? My ethnic background is Scotch, Irish, English, and German. I always wanted to be Swedish. And we've done this Ancestry.com stuff, my sister and I. And would you believe my blonde, blue-eyed sister has Swedish? I don't. Because that's how DNA works. Now, when I was growing up, we didn't sit around and say, oh, we're Scotch, Irish, English, Germans. But how do I know that that's my ethnicity? I'll tell you. It's because I love meat and potatoes and noodles and bread and butter. That's ethnic food for me. My favorite thing is roast beef over noodles over mashed potatoes with bread and butter. That's my favorite thing, right? Now, you who are ethnically Scotch-Irish Southerners without German, you like, what do you like? What's your favorite meal? Some, some truth, Judy, 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 Judy. Tell us what your favorite meal is here. Unmute yourself, Judy. Judy Jacob. Judy, unmute, Judy, Judy. She's trying it. She's pushing the button. She's still muted. She's trying. We're not getting her. Let me try somebody else. Uh, who else do I know that's a real Southerner here? Uh, Vicky, I can always depend on Vicky. Vicky, are you there? What's a good Southern meal? Well, I don't, I don't really like Southern food. So you asked the wrong person. My favorite meal is, is crab meat. Oh, okay. <laughs> do you have, do you have Louisiana connections? No, no. I'm oh. just Scotch, Irish, German. Yeah. I don't know about the English part but yeah. I just really like Southern food too much. Yeah, okay. Well, what you eat does reflect your, your ethnicity. And sometimes for some of us, our ethnicity was not important to our family of origin as we grew up. It wasn't emphasized. Now, uh, Amy, I believe that you do, do some ethnic cooking, don't you? Uh, I do make some of the... Uh, some of the dishes that my grandmother made, you know, German wise, we, I have her new recipes. Yep. Okay. Uh, God, God forbid I ever break that uh, one single cup because it's not a measuring cup that she ever used. Uh -huh. It was a teacup. It, it was, uh, it was actually one of uh, her side was German, but dad's grandpa's side was English. And it was one of grandpa's teacups that she used to make the German noodles. So don't break that cup. Okay. Uh, but you know we we like our breads we like our, um i don't do them very often but the scones uh -huh. you know because my my dad's side is english i'm only the fourth generation born in america uh -huh. on my dad's side uh the german goes back much much farther so so do you see that most of us would not wake up in the morning and say oh i'm going to celebrate my ethnicity today all right you, you get up and you look in the mirror and do whatever you have to do that requires looking in the mirror and you describe what you see as normal because that's you, right? And you don't think a whole lot about your ethnicity unless perhaps, and pacola has gone away. I can't, I don't have her face here, but some people's faces are different than other people's faces and they cannot hide their their supposed race or ethnicity. 
Now, it's at this point, I'm going to give you a little sidebar footnote. There really is no such thing as race. It is a social construct. That means that way back in history, some European scholars decided that they needed to separate people into groups. And they did it because they wanted to be clear about who was going to be in power. So they invented race. They began to describe people as being um, Caucasian, Negroid, Mongoloid. Um, and then when they discovered that there were people in the North and South American continents, the, those other people, the Indians as a group, we originally call them. But race is just something that we invented in order to separate ourselves. And we've done a very good job of it. So those of us who can identify because we look in the mirror and see it as white, don't realize that our default is that we don't have to identify as white because we are normal. Are you with me? We think that we are the norm. But today, 50% of the children in the United States are children of color. That means for all of you white folks who have grandchildren who are white or, well, see, then I immediately think we've got some that aren't white, right? Uh, I have two, I have two great nephews who are uh, half Guatemalan uh, American citizens and they, they have what we call great tans. <laughs> so in that household, half the, half the boys are white and half the boys are not white. Interesting. But when we think of what we know to be normal as being what we are, we then say anybody who isn't like us is not normal. Now we don't do this consciously. That's the problem. We don't do it consciously. It is embedded in how we are and who we are. It's the same thing we do when we look at people um, by uh, their physical abilities, all right? or their physical appearance. Now I've already commented, Gabby is a beautiful young lady and she's tall. How tall are you now? Are you close to six foot? Five, five seven. Five, just a little, just over five, seven. Just over five, seven. Gee, I thought she was taller than that. Well, you just, she's a nice slender girl. She's got pretty, pretty strawberry blonde hair. When I see her, I make assumptions based on other strawberry blonde, slender girls right? And I put my previous notions of what it means to, to be a slender, tallish, strawberry haired girl on Gabby. And I expect Gabby to behave the way that other strawberry blonde young girls tend to behave, right? Now, Gabby may or may not do that. I look at somebody who has white hair and I say, oh, that's an old person. Or I look at someone who's whose uh, hair is obviously uh, enhanced out of a bottle <laughs> and I make a different kind of judgment. I may, because I think that dyeing your hair is kind of silly because my little sister, you know, the blonde blue eyed one, uh, she started coloring her hair with that stuff called sun, sun bright. It was a spray on thing you put, you put, spray it on and you go outside and the, the, the sun would help your, you know, cause then she, cause she really wanted to be blonde. And she was blonde to start with, but she got less and less blonde, but now she's gotten more and more blonde, all right? So I have some biases about uh, blondes, all right? <laughs> we all have unconscious biases because of our own ethnicity, which is expressed or not expressed. There are, there are several Methodist churches in our country. We are currently members of the United Methodist Church. Uh, we can talk offline about, about what's going to happen next, but only God knows. But because of ethnicity and race, early in our United States history, African Americans who were kicked out of the churches that they had participated in, that were our predecessor Methodist churches, began their own denominations. 
and one was the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Then they had a little argument about something, and I don't know, I haven't studied that, that history well enough, but they, they began, there was a split, and they became the AME comma Zion, the African Methodist Episcopal Church Zion. So now there were two. Well, then you may have noticed that there are some others that are called CME, and you may have wondered, where did they come from? They originally were the colored Methodist Episcopal Church, and later they changed color to Christian. I recently found out why the colored Methodist became a separate denomination. Anybody know? Anybody else know? It had to do with the perception of race. The colored Methodist Episcopal Church was made up of rising, socioeconomically rising, African, African Americans who were lighter in color than other African Americans. In other words, the African Methodists split into another group because they wanted to be whiter. They wanted to assimilate into primarily white culture. Isn't that interesting? So this identification by color of skin is not restricted to white folks or African-American folks or Asian folks. There are all kinds of preconceived biases that have to do with appearance. So when you see somebody in a wheelchair coming to church, what do you, what do you think? You're out in the parking lot and you see somebody pull up in a, in a handicapped van and they roll out in a wheelchair. What's your, what's your response? that you immediately have to help them. And why do you have to help them, Rebecca? Well, you don't really. I mean, I, I experienced this with my mother when she had a stroke and she was in a wheelchair and yeah. I would take her to church. Yeah. And of course, I, I loaded her wheelchair. I mean, this was really, I guess it was reflected more on me than her, but I would drive up in the parking lot and I know it was all out of pure, you know, kindness that people wanted to help me, but uh -huh. getting it out was fine. But when I went to load her wheelchair, I wanted to load it a certain way so that I could get it out the yes. way I needed to. So that was, and I, you know, I would always tell them kindly, oh no, I, I can load it. But uh, I mean, that's kind of a side thing. It's not really because I was handicapped. But, because she was and I was her caretaker but uh anyway well, those are interesting little things right did, did anybody did anybody say oh my reaction was oh no somebody's coming to church in a wheelchair and we don't have a way for them to get in are all of your all of your sanctuaries handicapped accessible I can say that it is, and so that didn't come to mind. What I what I thought of more was where are we going to be able to place the wheelchair inside the sanctuary, or would they be able to get into a pew because our sanctuary is kind of crowded, and it's in order to be able to get them kind of where we can still walk past them, they either had to be stuck under the preacher at the front or way in the back behind the back pew. Okay, okay. So sometimes we have done the first piece of thinking about how to get people in, but then we don't know really how to make them feel welcome once they are in our space. And of course, the easiest thing is if you, you go down a pew and you cut it and you make a gap in the pew so that people can sit there. But you also think through where would someone in a, in a wheelchair really want to sit? Do they want to sit in the front or the back or the middle? Do they want to sit on the left or the right? These are things that often we don't we don't consider. Um, so, okay, now there's a presumption that a person in a wheelchair would need help or that the person with the person in a wheelchair would need help. Yes, all right. So I'm hearing impaired. That's not visible. You can't tell that I can't hear. I'll just leave it there. Um, 
What about people who can't walk there? Oh, there, leave it there. You know that that's what I do. And that is a real pet peeve of mine right now in our own church. Just try, and it's not a pet peeve in my own church. I think I've made people aware. Well, I mean, I think that people have been open to understand that, no, they're not hearing you. You can't walk away from the microphone, okay? No, the speakers are not appropriate. They've been there for 25 years and they need an update. And yes, we would like to have more than one pew that someone can sit on and hear out of the speaker. And so, you know, now because of our population um, and of course in the pandemic, even Zoom is a problem. You know, we've, we've had a problem with people being able to hear over Zoom because of their equipment that they have in their home. And, but, you know, we are starting some small group stuff and we had a UMW meeting on Monday where we know that there are two women who do not hear well. And the last meeting they came to, they said, they're not coming back. So we had to do some, some quick stuff and we set up a nice hearing system, an amplification system. And one of the ladies didn't make it, but it wasn't because she, wasn't sure we had tried but the other one I've talked to and she said oh yeah I still didn't get it all and, yeah. and the other part of that Pam is making them responsible for their own hearing if they don't hear they have to ask okay that's the other part of it so as people who demonstrate the characteristics of Jesus being compassionate and caring and empathetic we anticipate that there are people who need our help. So it's a matter of, of, of justice of us realizing that we have to be aware of who we are unawarely excluding. I do think that just as a side that Zoom is, is looking at some ways where you can have captioning, where there's real-time captioning and uh, thank you for that impassioned comment because that makes me remember, okay, in my technology, I need to- Okay, need but to also that. that part of it, think of the age group that may or may not be the most affected and they do not do technology well. It's so even though they have those possibilities, someone else is still gonna have to go in and try to make it easy. Yes, yes. And that's where, we, we give thanks that there are 14 and 15 year olds who know how to do technology, right? <laughs> and and in all seriousness, you know, uh, there are things that happen in the world that we have all the best intentions. These little communion cups, this, the, the, the connect the, oh, you know what I'm talking about, those little, the little communion cup that has the awful taste in grape juice and the terrible taste in cracker, right? For years, um, before the pandemic, I have known of churches that put those in little baggies and their caring, loving people who were able to do so would drive to the homes of shut-ins and deliver those so that the people who were shut in at home could use those for communion on communion Sundays, right? And if the church service was broadcast on TV or radio or whatever, then those shut-ins were able to take communion, right? Except I know too many people that can't open those darn things, you know? And also, well, I'm not going to go there because this is being recorded, right? Okay, so what we need to do now is I need to quickly get to the end of this business about privilege to say, are you all getting an understanding of what it means to be socially located, that you are a different person than the other people that you know and that you don't know? And that there are certain things about your life because of that social location that affect how you read scripture. So now let's just quickly look at how do we locate Jesus, right? What is Jesus's social location? Jesus was male when we first, when we first meet him, right? He's 30, which means he's a man, a, a male of status of some sort, because he's that old. Um, he's, he's got a mother. 
uh, interesting uh, experiences. In the Gospel of Mark, do we know anything about Jesus's birth? What's in the beginning of the Gospel of Mark? Is there a nativity story? No. So go back to thinking about your, your Gospels. Matthew and Luke tell us about Jesus's family of origin. Mark doesn't. Mark jumps right in and tells us in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is what happened. John the baptizer was baptizing people and Jesus came and Jesus got baptized. And then what happened? Tell me what happened. Jesus got baptized. And then what happened? Somebody jump in. Tell me. He was tempted. Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted. The devil, how Satan drove him compelled him into the desert for temptation. But before that, the dove came down and said, hey, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. There was an identification of Jesus being socially located as the son of God, beloved, and then drove, been driven into the wilderness so that he could locate himself in himself as who he was as a beloved child, all right? Now you remember quickly your baptism. Remember your baptism or remember what they told you about your baptism. You were declared by the power of God in the waters of baptism to be a beloved daughter of God. If you were immersed, you physically experienced the theological reality that in baptism we are buried with Christ, and then we are raised with Christ. And, one, and in that baptism, we are commissioned into ministry in the same way that Jesus was commissioned into ministry. Baptism is the commissioning of you, you into ministry. Everybody I'm looking at is a minister of the good news of Jesus Christ. That's pretty phenomenal stuff. It's pretty exciting stuff, okay? Now, I'm gonna read three things and then we're gonna take a five minute break because I just saw on the news this morning that Zoom meetings, people need to take a break. And I had, I thought, a, an alarm set on my um, little phone here, but it, it didn't go off because it wasn't set. So now I've got the next one set. So we'll take a five minute break in just a moment and then we'll come back. Listen to this word from Oscar Romero. Oscar Romero was a bishop in Latin America who was murdered while he was celebrating mass. He says, we cannot segregate God's word from the historical reality in which it is proclaimed. It would not then be God's word, it would be history. It could be a pious book, a Bible that is just a book in our library. It becomes God's word, the Bible, becomes God's word because it vivifies, enlightens, contrasts, repudiates, praises what is going on today in this society. That's what the Bible is. Then Ched Myers, who wrote a wonderful book about uh, Jesus, the strong man, about the Gospel of Mark, says, Mark's Jesus envisioned social reconstruction from the bottom up. Jesus's practice of inclusiveness and equality questioned all forms of political and personal domination. This Jesus called for a revolution of means as well as ends, enjoining his followers to embrace nonviolence and to risk its consequences. And then finally, Walter Brueggemann, great scholar of our time, Old Testament scholar who frequently makes the connections of the Old Testament to our practice of Christianity says, it is likely that our theological problem in the church is that our gospel is a story believed, shaped and transmitted by the dispossessed. And we are now a church of possession for whom the rhetoric of the dispossessed is offensive. Let me read that one again, because this is really good. Our theological problem today is the gospel is a story believed, shaped, and transmitted by the dispossessed. Think about the Old Testament. The Israelites are slaves in Egypt. They're dispossessed. God brings them out. Now they become people of possession 
and they begin to write their faith experience. And what do they do? They mess up and act like they're possessors instead of remembering their, their, that everything came from God. Because now, Brueggemann says, we are now a church of possession for whom the rhetoric of the dispossessed is offensive. All right, we'll take a five minute break. We'll see you back in five minutes. The General Board of Global Missions, that, that song is number one on the Global Praise number two. There are three CDs. Um, number one is green, two is red, and number three is blue. And if you wanna get, you wanna get revved up with, with multicultural uh, music, that's the way to go. And uh, there also are the songbooks themselves, and they have the same covers that match match the books, and everybody should have them in your in your church because we need to be singing different different songs. That's that's just my bias, you know. So let me read you a definition of uh, from our from our textbook. Um, white supremacy. Now, when we talk about Jesus as the liberator, one of the things we have to own is the reality of white supremacy. And this is the definition. White supremacy is historically based, institutionally perpetuated system of exploitation and oppression of continents, nations, and peoples of color by white peoples and nations of the European continent, which is to say those of us who are descendants of the European continent, for the purpose of maintaining and defending a system of wealth, power, and privilege. Now that's that's a hard definition because it it points to us, right? But when we can confess that we benefit from that, we can address it. And when we recognize that it's a reality, and I would say that perhaps in 2021, it's harder to deny that that's a reality, we can wrestle with what it means as faithful Christians to live in a world where this institutionally perpetuated system of exploitation and oppression is at work because it's part of what it means, I think, to be a Christian. And we see it in what uh, Jesus did. So now we're gonna go to the text. If you'll find in your New Testament, Mark 2, verses one to 12. And I'm gonna ask if someone who has the um, message would be ready, ready to read that for us. And somebody who has uh, the NIV or and the NRSV, we want to hear this scripture in more than one way, okay? So we'll get a volunteer to read for us. Don't everybody jump in at once. If no one else has a message, I think I can get one. Will you repeat the script? Mark 2, 1 through 12. Mark 2, 1 through 12. I have, I have the, okay. Good, a bunch of people have it. All right. If you'll unmute, then I'll know that you want I to I was going to read the common English. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> read the common English Bible. Okay. Mark 2. 1 through 12. After a few days, Jesus went back to Capernaum and people heard that he was, was at home. So many gathered that there was no longer space, not even near the door. Jesus was speaking the word to them. Some people arrived and four of them were bringing to him a man who was paralyzed. They couldn't carry him through the crowd, so they tore off part of the roof above where Jesus was. When they had made an opening, they lowered the mat on which the paralyzed man was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic child, your sins are forgiven. Some legal experts were sitting there muttering among themselves. Why does he speak this way? He's insulting God. Only the one God can forgive sins. Jesus immediately recognized what they were discussing. He said to them, why do you fill your minds with these questions? 
Which is easier to say to a paralyzed person, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your bed and walk. But so you will know that the human one has authority on the earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, get up, take your mat and go home. Jesus raised him up and right away, he picked up his mat and walked out in front of everybody. They were all amazed and praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this. Thank you. Now that's the common English Bible. That's the scripture that is now used with your adult Bible study series and with many of the things produced by Cokesbury. It is analogous to the translation that came out in the 70s, uh, which was called the Good News, uh, the Today's English Version. The translator's intention in creating this version is to uh, use vocabulary that is not specifically religious. So a person with no background who isn't privileged by having grown up in the church, for example, can understand uh, the, the, the word uh, of God. And you'll notice then that instead of religious scholars, it was legal scholars. And instead of paraplegic, uh, which maybe your text has, or a paralytic, a paralyzed man. It just said, it said paralyzed man, right? Yeah. So it's a simplified vocabulary and that that's good. That's good. All right. Uh, Vicki came back with the message. Whoop, you're, you're not muted. You're up, you're, you're. I thought I had unmuted. Okay. After a few days, Jesus returned to Capernaum and word got around that he was back home. A crowd gathered, jamming the entrance so no one could get in or out. He was teaching the word. They brought a paraplegic to him, carried by four men. When they weren't able to get in because of the crowd, they removed part of the roof and lowered the paraplegic on his stretcher. Impressed by their bold belief, Jesus said to the paraplegic, Son, I forgive your sins. Some religion scholars sitting there started whispering among themselves, he can't talk that way. That's blasphemy. God and only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew right away what, what they were thinking and says, why are you so skeptical? Which is simpler to say to the paraplegic, I forgive your sins or say, get up, take your stretcher and start walking. Well, just so it's clear that I'm the son of man and I thought and authorized to do either or both. He looked now at the paraplegic, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. And the man did it, got up, grabbed his stretcher and walked out with everyone there watching him. They rubbed their eyes incredulous and then praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this. Ah, isn't that wonderful? The message, you know, was, was, uh, is a paraphrase of scripture done by Eugene Peterson, a Presbyterian pastor and scholar. And uh, his Presbyterian bias sometimes shows through in how he translates. But doesn't he have a wonderful way of, of choosing the words that he puts together? And so in the common English Bible, removing a religious word was the statement. Um, he can't talk that, that way. That's insulting to God. Now we know what blasphemy is. Blasphemy is insulting God. Now we have to ask the question. What exactly is the insult to God that Jesus has done? He has taken authority to forgive sin and only God can forgive sin. Except that now Jesus comes to say, no, I have the authority to forgive sins and to heal. I can do one or either or both. And I will remind you who remember, you are all commissioned by power of baptism to be as Jesus in the world today. So in the same way that Jesus was in his social location, in his time, now you, each of you, each of us are also commissioned to do those liberating things that Jesus did, which includes forgiving people's sins. Now, I read you the definition of white supremacy. One of the sins that we are confronting as United Methodist Christians is this sin of the effects of racist policy in our world. You are not racist 
because you're a bad person. Being a racist has nothing to do with whether or not you're a good person, because I think probably you are all sinners. Am I right? I know Judy Jacob is. <laughs> we are sinners. So we, we are not perfect people, but we are redeemed sinners commissioned by the power of Jesus, right? And so what we know we need to do is to confront what has paralyzed us and what has paralyzed us in 2021. We've been paralyzed by divisive messages of hatred, of othering. We have othered all kinds of groups. We other, we who are over 65, other people who are under 21. We talk in terrible ways about Gen, Gen X and Y and Z and millennials. I've done it myself. I find myself, well, you know how those millennials are. Well, no, I don't really know how millennials are. I know how individual people who happen to be in that age group are. So I need to repent of my sin against this othering of people and ask God to help me be healed. And the first step is to be forgiven, to be forgiven. And it's hard work to be forgiven because all of us have sins in our lives that we want to hold on to. We want to ask God to forgive us for it, but then we hold on to it. God, forgive me for being impatient. I pray this every Lent, every darn Lent. I say, oh, Lord, help me be patient. Please, now, right now. <laughs> right? I mean, it's absurd. It's what we do. But if I really wanted to be healed of it, I would have to say, God, show me how to be patient. So sometimes we want a quick, easy forgiveness without the hard work of what take, what comes later. So isn't it interesting in this story that Jesus, because of the faith of the four friends, you remember a few years ago when this was in vacation Bible school, y'all remember doing vacation Bible school where this is one of the stories? Um, gosh, it's been a long time. Uh, but it, it was one of the stories you were supposed to act out. And in the church I was in, they were all so excited. They wanted to do this, act it out the whole, the whole way. And so we figured out a way to do it. And the way to do it was we had this drop, this backstage, and back, backdrop. And the kid on the, on the uh, stretcher was brought down the aisle by the four kids. And, they, and then they went around behind because like they were going to go up on the roof. And they got up on, on, on chairs and they were, on these chairs and you could see that the kid on the stretcher was on the stretcher right and then they pretended to break the to, to break the roof and then they all got down and then they pushed the stretcher in in at the bottom of the backdrop so that there he was in front of Jesus it was the coolest thing and when the kid got to roll up his stretcher and push his way out of the little crowd of all the kids it was just the most wonderful thing because we could see it that sometimes for people, for situations to be changed, we have to push away the crowds who want everything to stay the same. The people who had already gotten there in that house in Capernaum didn't want to make room for anybody else because they wanted to keep Jesus for themselves. Sometimes we want to keep Jesus for ourselves too, don't we? But instead, Jesus says, wow, such bold belief that they, uh, one, of, one of the translations I have is, it says, um, they took away the roof and having gouged out an opening, they lower the pallet. Wow, you're paralyzed and they're letting you down from the roof into a room that's filled with people. How do you think you would feel then? Well, how do we feel today knowing that Jesus wants to free us and heal us. The forgiveness leads to the healing, but sometimes the healing leads to forgiveness. If I say evangelical, what do you say? What's your response? What when I say evangelical, what, what's your first word of response? Kathy Blackwood, I say evangelical, you say I think conservative. Ah, 
I say evangelical Bonnie Adcox, what do you say? She's got to unmute on her phone. This is hard. She can't get there. I, I'd say traditional. Traditional. Evangelical. Conservative, traditional. Anybody have another word that they use, Vicki? Spiritual. Spiritual. Okay. What does evangelical actually mean? Evangel is good news. An evangelical could be a person who believes in the good news. But you see, words don't always mean what they used to mean, right? Like there was a book by the, um, you remember Cheaper by the Dozen? Y'all remember that book? And the sisters of that book became great little writers. And they wrote this great little book about their experience traveling to Europe. And the name of it is, our hearts were young and gay, right? Now, today, if I told you that I was reading a book called Our Hearts Were Young and Gay, you would make an assumption, wouldn't you? You'd say, oh, that must be a memoir about somebody who's uh, come out of the closet and is a homosexual. But you see, that wasn't what that book was about at all. It was about the gayness of enjoying life and being uh, embroiled in it. And, and so now the word gay means something different. Well, the same thing with evangelical. I want us as United Methodist women to reclaim the positive meaning of evangelical. An evangelical ought to be someone not conservative, but overflowing with the prodigality of God, the abundance of God, because we believe in good news. It's good news that the liberator wants to come to free everybody. In the oppressed and the oppressor. Because one of the things that I've been learning as I've been reading in this, this period of the pandemic, I've been reading a lot about the history of our country from different perspectives. And one of the things that I, I think I am learning is that being the oppressor, being a white woman of privilege hurts me. It hurts the people I love, because it's not appropriate as a Christian to be an oppressor. It is appropriate as a follower of the liberator to walk in mutuality with other people. One of the ways I could say this is when I came back from seminary, they wanted to know what they were going to call me down at Camden First Year Methodist Church. And I was coming out of this very egalitarian period where, you know, I was big on, we're all, you know, in Christ, we're all one. And the fact that I'm ordained doesn't mean that I'm better than you or anything. I've gotten past that. Now I know I am, but anyway, um, that's a joke. Um, I said, oh, well, but I just, you know, what they said, what do you want us to call you? And I said, well, just Pam, Pam's fine. And, and, and one of the dear saints there said, no, no, Pam. We have to have something else to call you because we call the, we call the preacher brother so-and-so. And um, if you don't tell us what to call you, then we'll have to call you Sister Pam. And I said, no, 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 anything but that, right? So that's why we came up with Pastor Pam, because in Camden, children especially are raised to know that they don't call adults by their first name. You call them Miss Somebody, right? So children at Grand Avenue in Stuttgart don't call Miss Jacobs Miss Jacobs. They probably call her Miss Judy. Is that right? That's right. Now, up, up in Northwest Arkansas, there probably aren't as many children who call you Miss Kathy, are there? Kathy Blackwood, because there's a difference in culture. Well, I was called, I said, call me Pastor Pam. And one sweet little girl, when I came to Little Rock, she was raised so well, she called me Miss Pastor Pam. So, it could be that I'm a member of the oppressive class if I behave as a pastor, as if I am more important than you, because you're just a lay person. But that's hurtful to me as a Christian, because it separates us from the common mutual task we have. So if it's hurtful to be a person who oppresses somebody, and it clearly is hurtful to be oppressed, 
then we must come with our friends. If we are the friends who have Sorry, bold faith. I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, shut up. My watch thinks I was asking it something. Um, we must ask if we need to be forgiven, if we need to be healed. And some people in the evangelical tradition think that the first thing we have to do is save somebody. We have to get them to say, I believe in Jesus Christ. But what we know to be true is Jesus doesn't ask anybody to make a confession of faith here. Instead, Jesus goes on the incredible trust that the four friends have to decide to heal the man. Then the people who want to be in charge of things say, nope, nope, that's not the way it's supposed to work. They say, you can't do that. Only God can take this action. And Jesus says, well, okay, if you don't like the way I've done it, I'll just do it the other way. You're healed. Now, you have the, you have the power and authority. Dear sister, you have the power and authority to say in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. You know that, don't you? Because in church worship, that's what we do. We say the prayer of confession and then somebody, usually the preacher, gives these words of, of assurance. God has, has given us grace and power. God will help you be restored on the path. God will help you do whatever. Because I, I, you know, I want to I want to give you assurance of what the specific thing is you confess. But the bottom line is that I then, as the pastor, say, in the name, I say, hear the good news, now and forever true. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And then the part I love, you say back to me, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And then we say together, glory to God. That is good news. That is good news that you have the authority, power, and responsibility to give. So what are the places in your faith community where people are paralyzed that they need to be told, pack that up and let's get on with it? You with me? There are places in every, it sounds like in Vicki's church, that maybe you have a, a group of trustees like, like I, I've had some places where they won't talk about it for about a year before they decide to do something. You know, we got to have a plan and then we have to have a plan about the plan and then we appoint a committee to study the plan. And then we have another committee that says, well, we don't have the money. <clears throat> I want to go on record that that is not what I was saying, but that's no, okay. I know. Go I ahead. Know. We're going to make it on record. She's not, she's not, she's not saying that. But I have experienced occasions when we know we need to do something, but we're waiting for somebody else to do it. Well, if you don't want to do it by yourself, be like those, those friends, get three other people to help you gouge out the room, right? Because you have the responsibility to live into being an evangelical an evangelical liberator. That's who you are. That's what, this, that's what this part of the gospel tells us, that Jesus was willing to claim his own authority and to demonstrate for us what that's supposed to look like. Okay, I'm checking my thing here. Okay, so I wanna show you a book as we move to our next text. Our next text will be Mark 5, 1 to 20, 1 to 20. While you're finding that, I haven't finished this book. I just started it. But this is one of the books that our general church has asked us to read and study, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. And if you have not, if you, if you feel like your study of American history was uh, deficient because like, you, like me, you never got past the Civil War in an American history class, the war between the states, as you all call it down here. You might also wanna read his book, Stamped from the Beginning, which is a history that explains uh, some of the things that I've made statements about that, that this is a systemic thing. So his last name is Kendi, K-E-N-D-I, widely, widely available, all right. So Mark 5, 
1 to 20, as you're finding it, I'm going to read it to you from a translation I like. It's by a Greek Orthodox scholar. Um, yep, I'm going to read it to you from that translation. Mark 5, 1 to 20. And they came to the far shore of the sea into the region of Gerasenes. And as Jesus disembarked from the boat, there came out to meet him from the tombs, a man with an impure spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one was able any longer to bind him with the chain since he had often been bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been torn asunder by him and the fetters shattered and no one had the strength to subdue him. And always, every night and day, he was among the tombs and in the mountains, crying out and gashing himself with stones. And seeing Jesus from afar, the man ran and prostrated himself to Jesus. And crying aloud, out with a loud voice, he says, what do I and you have to do with one another? Jesus, son of the highest God, I adjure you by God not to torment me. For Jesus had said to him, come out from the man into your spirit. And Jesus asked the man, what is your name? And the man replied, my name is Legion because we are many. And he vehemently implored Jesus that he not send him out of the land. Now there near the mountain, a large herd of swine was feeding. And they entreated him saying, send us into the swine so that we might enter into them. So Jesus gave them leave. And coming forth, the impure spirits entered into the swine, and the herd charged down the precipice into the sea, about 2,000, and were suffocated in the sea. And those grazing them fled and reported it in the city and in the fields, and they came to see what it is that had happened. And they come to Jesus and see the demoniac, the one who had had legion in him, seated, clothed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And the eyewitnesses recounted to them how this had happened to the demoniac and all about the swine. And they began to implore Jesus to pass on beyond their borders. And as he embarked into the boat, the former demoniac begged Jesus that he might be with him. And Jesus did not permit him, but said, go to your house, to your own family, and report to them the things the Lord has done for you, that he has showed you mercy. And the man departed and began to proclaim in the ten cities the things Jesus did for him, and everyone was amazed. That's De uh, David Bentley Hart's translation. Now, you know that story very well, and you have wondered about it. One of the, you've wondered various and sundry things. So as we like to say, what's this story really about? If Jesus is the liberator, who is Jesus liberating? Oh, it's too obvious. He's liberating the man who has been controlled by something that we don't understand. He's been controlled by something that the community of his social location has not understood. And their response to him was to lock him up. Statistics tell us all kinds of interesting things about who's in prison. There are today more African-American men in prison than were ever enslaved previous to the beginning of the Civil War. An African-American male born today has a 50-50 chance of ending up incarcerated during his lifetime. A huge percentage of people of all colors and both men and women are in jail who have not ever yet been to trial. Most of the people who are in jail without having been to trial are people who are poor who cannot afford bail. So if you got arrested 
or your son or daughter or grandchild got arrested, what would you do? Why, you would go right down and bail them out because you have the financial resources either to write a check or to go to the bank or to go to the bail bondsman and you would get your child out of jail, wouldn't you? Because that's what we do. This man, we don't know anything about except that he has been pushed out of his community and chained up. But the chains can't keep him confined. And so he annoys the whole community because he wanders screaming. He wanders around screaming. Now today, when I hear somebody screaming, it's the sound of the sirens going past. I live off of Cantwell so I can hear them. Whenever I hear sirens, I, I send up a prayer. Lord, in your mercy, be with those who are driving whatever that is. It could be the fire truck, because that's just down from my house less than a mile. It could be an ambulance. It could be a police car. I don't know what it is. I send up a prayer, and then I go back to what I'm doing. Because the screams in the night don't bother me. Well, they bother me, but I don't think I can do anything about it. Now, United Methodist Women, one of the books on our reading program is uh, called Push. And it's about how African-American girls are more likely to be disciplined at school than Gabby is. Of course, virtually, it's kind of hard to discipline people. You, I don't know what we're going to do when we all go back to school. But if you're in school and you do something and you're a person of color, you're more likely to be treated differently from the person of no color. And so this book on our reading program talks about how it is that black girls are disciplined in school, tend to either get punished at school or outside school in the system, and they get sent down the pipeline to prison. And one of our goals in United Methodist Women is to address the concerns that we have about children and youth and women. And one of those concerns is what are we going to do about this inequity, this difference that's based on color, this difference that's based on different ways of viewing things. And friends, sometimes it is so subtle that we don't realize what's happening. When I moved as a, as a preteen from Kansas to Arkansas and I went to school, the first thing that happened was a teacher took me aside in the seventh grade and said, we don't behave that way here. What was it I had done? Raised my hand and spoken up. Unafraid to express my opinion. Unafraid to disagree. Unafraid to question. Because that wasn't what we were supposed to do in the seventh grade. In the seventh grade, we were supposed to sit in nice, tidy little rows and say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. But you know what? In Kansas, that wasn't how we did it. I had a teacher for two years, fifth and sixth grade, who encouraged us to question, who encouraged us to participate, who encouraged us to collaborate, but not she. And so when I was confronted with a different way of seeing things, well, it was kind of shocking. They tried to lock me up. It didn't work, as you can see. Now, today we lock people up when we want everybody to behave the way we behave. And bless you, we I met this women, you do it and you don't even realize you do it. Here's how you do it. You're gonna have a bereavement meal and you tell people to bring food. This will be in the future again, but it used to, you, used to, you did it in the past. You're gonna have a meal and you tell people that you need them to bring food. And so here comes some new to your church person who's gonna bring a dish. And she comes in with her dish and you look at it and you say, oh, we don't serve that at bereavement meals. If you're not guilty of this, you're guilty of something else. You're guilty because you say, oh, no, no, no. Only this, these are the people who do that in the kitchen. Every church I have served has had at least one woman tell me that she was locked out of full participation 
by women who would be crushed to realize they've done it. But you did it. So you have to do what you have to do is you have to look at the impure spirit that is keeping you from seeing that other people are there in front of you who want to be included in. Got it? That's what it means to be a liberator like Jesus. It means to look and see, now, why do we do it the way we do it? And when we do it that way, are we making room for the people that we say, well, I don't know why they won't come. I don't know why they won't participate. I have learned as a survival skill to use humor. And so the big joke that I use with, with churches is when we, I come in, I say, now, I don't cook much, but I do have two dishes. I make a mean three bean salad. It has more than three beans. That's part of the joke. And I make a terrific three bean chili, which is also a joke because it has more than three beans. And some people get it and don't expect me to do anything else. But some congregations expect people to follow the rules that are not explicitly stated. Now, we're worshiping many of us only virtually. And so it's hard to know what the rules are going to be when we get back together because we will have forgotten. And now would be a good time to think about how are we going to truly welcome the people who have been chained up? How are we going to go about looking for people who have managed to break their fetters? There's a divorced couple in your church. And they left when they got divorced because neither one of them could figure out whether there was going to be room for both of them divorced. So they just gave up and both left. And when that happened, it meant that the children who had always come to church didn't know what to do because it felt like a betrayal if they went to church without their parents. And if their parents didn't have a good supportive community who knew that getting divorced is not the absolute worst thing in the world. That's what we, we as United Methodists believe. It is a regrettable reality at times. We didn't do something to help them. Now, when I was at St. James in, in Little Rock, Brother John would tell people, because we were fond of saying we were, the, we were the church of the second chance. A lot of people there were singles who had gotten divorced. And then you know what happens in singles group? People get married. <laughs> and then some of them get divorced again. Well. Brother John would make it clear. If you, if you go through a divorce, you still stay in our church because we have four worship services. And so if you've always gone to one service or another, you're going to come, you and I, Brother John would say to this couple, we're going to figure it out. And we're going to figure out how you can go to service and not see her and she can go to service and not see you. And you can take your children so your children will know that that's what we do. Divorce does not change that we worship God. We're not going to be chained up by divorce. We're going to be liberated by the grace and forgiveness of God. Okay. All right. Now, as you go to lunch, and we're going to, how, how much time do you need for lunch? Can we do, can we do teacher lunch of 22 minutes? Is that too long? Is that, is that long enough? 22 minutes? Okay. So, we're going to finish at 12 and then we'll come back at 1222. What I want you to think about during lunch is how can you practice amazement as a child of the liberating Jesus? How can you resist evil in the world? Two, two things. How can you practice amazement and how can you resist evil? All right. And you'll know it's time to come back when you hear more music. I'll, I'll put the music on again. All right. Thank you all. See you in 22 minutes. 29 and uh we have an hour and seven minutes to cover a whole lot more uh while while you're finding that place mark 9 14 to 29 let me remind you that the plans are to have mission you this summer uh, and I am not certain, I've not been in on, on, on the planning, but I'm wondering aloud, Kathy, are you on that planning team? Kathy Blackwood? Yes, ma'am. Uh, are, are we thinking of offering it in some way virtually as well as in person? 
We, we have begun looking at that just as a, a plan B and, and possibly have one of the study leaders do their, their class via Zoom, but we're still, we're still looking at that and working on it. We're gonna get with Dee Dee Roberts and, um, oh, what's her name? Um, anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna start working on something. Yeah, good. Well, we're all, I heard somebody saying during lunch, the question of, we're all gonna learn how to do this Zoom stuff and then when we get to go back together, we won't do it anymore. Everything that your pastors are reading and being told is that the new normal is not to subtract, but to add. So what we have discovered, even, even our music person has discovered that some people who couldn't come to choir practice now are participating in a virtual choir because they can record their part of the anthem and then bless her heart, she, she knits it all together and which many of your music people are doing so that it's, um, it's a marvelous piece of music. So uh, I, don't, I don't see anybody going back to just the way it was uh, a year ago. I think we're all gonna learn to continue to use this technology as a way to reach out on beyond uh, our geographic boundaries and also to be, and I, this is my little pledge to myself, to think of ways that are more appropriate for online audiences. Because right now, what I've been doing is pretty much, you know, I'm sitting in the chair here talking to you. And our worship service is um, the camera doing what we've always done. So anyway. That leads us to Mark 9, 14 to 29. Uh, Bonnie, I want you to read that again to us in that good CEB, if you don't mind, please. Okay. When Jesus, Peter, James, and John approached the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them and legal experts arguing with them. Suddenly, the whole crowd caught sight of Jesus. They ran to greet him, overcome with excitement. Jesus asked them, what are you arguing about? Someone from the crowd responded, teacher, I brought my son to you since he has a spirit that doesn't allow him to speak. Wherever it overpowers him, it throws him into a fit. He foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth and stiffens up. So I spoke to your disciples to see if they could throw it out, but they couldn't. Jesus answered them, you faithless generation, how long will I be with you? How long will I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a fit. He fell on the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked his father, how long has this been going on? He said, since he was a child, it has often thrown him into a fire or into water, trying to kill him. If you can do anything, help us. Show us compassion. Jesus said to him, if you can do anything, all things are possible for the one who has faith. At that, the boy's father cried out, I have faith, help my lack of faith. Noticing that the crowd had surged together, Jesus spoke harshly to the unclean spirit, mute and deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. After screaming and shaking the boy horribly, the spirit came out. The boy seemed to be dead. In fact, several people said that he had died, but Jesus took his hand, lifted him up and he arose. After Jesus went into a house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we throw this spirit out? Jesus answered, throwing this kind of spirit out requires prayer. Thank you. So you, you're familiar with this story. If you've ever had anyone in your family of acquaintance uh, who suffered from epilepsy, you know how scary that sometimes can be. Um, and um, this, this was especially dangerous because the child is, is being thrown into uh, danger. Doesn't look like anything can happen. Uh, this follows the passage that, that Trudy read for us earlier about the transfiguration. Jesus has taken three of the disciples up. Now they come back. And while they've been gone, the other disciples, nine of them can't figure out what to do with this sick kid. Um, let's, let's hear it again just to get it in our little mindsets. Uh, Vicki, can I bother you again to read it for us on the message? Is Vicki back? Yes, it is. Oh, good. Okay. 
Okay, can you, let's see. Nine, chapter nine, 14 to 29. Chapter nine. You caught me doing something. I'm sorry. <laughs> they called out. Okay, nine, where does it start? 14. 14. Okay, when they came back down the mountain to the other disciples, they saw a huge crowd around them and the religion scholars cross-examining them. As soon as the people in the crowd saw Jesus, admiring excitement stirred them. They ran and greeted him. He asked, what's going on? What's all the commotion? The man out of the crowd answered, teacher, I brought my mute son made speechless by a demon to you. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him into the ground. He foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and goes stiff as a board. I told your disciples, hoping they could deliver him, but they couldn't. Jesus said, what a generation. No sense of God. How many times do I have to go over these things? How much longer do I have to put up with this? Bring the boy here. They brought him. When the demon saw Jesus, it threw the boy into a seizure, causing him to writhe on the ground and foam at the mouth. He asked his, the boy's father, how long has he, this been going on? Ever since he was a little boy, many times it pitches him into fire or the river to do away with him. If you can do anything, do it. Have a heart and help us. Jesus said, if, there are no ifs among believers, anything can happen. No sooner were the crowd's out, words out of his mouth than the father cried. Then I believe, help me with my doubts. Seeing that the crowd was forming fast, he gave the vile spirit its marching orders. Dumb and deaf spirit, I command you, out of him to stay out. Screaming and with much thrashing about, it left. The boy was pale as a corpse, so people started saying, he's dead. But Jesus, taking his hand, raised him, and the boy stood up. How much farther was it? 229. 29. After arriving back home, his disciples cornered Jesus and asked, why couldn't we throw the demon out? He answered, there is no way to get rid of this kind of demon except by prayer. All right. Thank you. So an interesting scene. The, the distraught father has brought his son and the disciples are not able to do anything efficacious. And so the religious scholars are cross-examining the disciples. They're asking the disciples some sorts of questions. Obviously, they're taking advantage of the fact that Jesus isn't there to help them out with the answers. Sometimes we get asked questions and we feel like Jesus isn't there to give us the answer or at least I do. Somebody asks me something and I say, well, gosh, I, I don't know. I just, I want to think I know, but I, if I'm going to be honest, I have to admit, I don't know. Um, one of the things that is a danger to us in the church is when we are too certain that we know everything that we need to know. I believe that one of the dangers that we have as, as, faith communities is being certain that we know that what we're doing is what we're supposed to be doing. I believe, I, I consider it appropriate for us to question the rightness of what we're doing, to examine it. The disciples have, have given up trying to, to, to heal this boy and Jesus, isn't this interesting? Jesus comes and says, what's, what's all the commotion? what's what's the problem now in the translation that i'm referring to david hart benton says the scribes were arguing with the disciples and on seeing jesus all the crowd were greatly amazed and ran up to him and hailed him and jesus inquired of them what are you arguing about with them so there's been there's been a discussion a debate an argument about the fact that this child is sick. Now, in the social location of Jesus at this time, a sick person is sick because they're a sinner or 
because somebody else has sinned. So the crowd probably has been talking to this father saying, well, your boy must have done something wrong. He must, he must be a sinner and that's why he's this way. And if the father protested and said, no, he, he's, this has been the way he's been since he was a little child before he could do anything. He, he hasn't sinned. They would have easily turned on him and said, well, you or your wife must have sinned. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a really sick child and you couldn't, you couldn't make them well and you just, you were at your wits end and you thought, what do we do, right? What do we do? And, and sometimes the illnesses are not physical. Sometimes they're emotional and you think to yourself, you just want to pull your hair out. And, you, and I know you parents and grandparents is what you say. You say, what did we do wrong? And then we answer, we say, well, we don't think we did anything wrong. Sometimes stuff happens. My niece and nephew both came down with uh, adolescent epilepsy. I didn't even know it, it was a, a, a real thing until they got it. It's about the time that, that um, the little girl got, was hitting puberty. And so he, he's a little bit older, about 15 months older. So they both, they both evidenced this at the same time. And um, the epilepsy that he had was the kind that you could see, you could see that he was having a fit, right? We don't call it fit anymore, right? We call it a seizure. That, that was an inappropriate thing. But poor Jessica, her, her seizures were the sort that she just looked like she was being a teenager. Do you know what I mean? You know, that, that look that teenagers have, they're not there. And ironically, she, she was triggered, her seizures were triggered by math class. Now, you know how math class kind of does that to you anyway, right? No offense to any math teachers. But the repetition in math class was like flashing lights to, to, to other people who have epilepsy. And she would go into this seizure, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't apparent she was in a seizure. She'd do it at home and her mother, my sister, uh, the famous blonde with blue eyes would say to herself, this kid is just being obstinate. She is, she is being uh, stubborn. She's not paying attention to me. And so when, they, when we found out that no, she was actually having a seizure, it was, it was a relief. My sister then communicated with others in the family to say, we've just had this diagnosis and we think that the rest of you, there were a whole bunch of cousins on, on the kid's father's side of the family. And she sent to the grandmother news. She said, you know, you, you need to, to know that we've had this diagnosis and, and uh, we know it's not the Estes side of the family because my, because my brother and my sister had both had uh, brain scans that show that, you know, we're perfectly normal. Well, this did not go over well, as you could well imagine, but she was just trying to, to be helpful. Sometimes when we point the finger of helpfulness, it's not that helpful. The people who were telling this man with this child who was suffering that it must have been sin is not helpful to the man who is worried about his child dying. And Jesus's response is one of utter frustration, isn't it? He says, how much longer do I have to put up with this? What is it that he's having to put up with? The disciples aren't getting it. They're not understanding what they need to understand. And they have not defaulted to the easy solution. What's the solution? How do you, how do you cast out demons? How do you help people? You pray. Now, remember I said to you that each of you by baptism has the responsibility, power, and privilege to cast out demons. What are the demons that need to be cast out in the community where you live? Now, you think about that, and I'm going to tell you another story. So there I was at St. James. I was one of four pastors on staff. And we kind of had a rotation that if somebody called and they needed a pastor, then the secretary would route those calls to us. So one day I get a message from, from uh, Mary Peck and the secretary. And she says, it's your turn. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, this woman calls all the time. And I said, okay. So I called and the woman was, was um, audibly distressed. You could tell from her voice that she was obsessed and upset. So I talked to her and I said, uh, 
what 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 seems to pro be the problem? How can I help you? And she said, I'm demon possessed. Now, I immediately became afraid. I channeled these disciples who were down on the on the not up on the mountain with Jesus, but are down there with the situation. And I thought, I don't know what to do about this. This woman says she's demon possessed. This is absurd. People in the United States aren't demon possessed. This is 1994. People don't get, uh, they aren't. But then I thought, no, this woman says to me, she's possessed by a demon. Therefore, I need to enter her social location. Her social location is she's possessed by a demon. So I said to her, after having said a very quick prayer, which was basically, God, help me. I don't know what to do, right? And God said, go back to scripture. So I remembered the scripture. And I remembered how the apostles after the resurrection would do things that they didn't know they could do. And they did it in the name of Jesus, right? Somebody asked, asks Peter for money at the temple. They need a handout. And he says, you know, I don't have any money, but I can give you what I can give you in the name of Jesus. So I said to this woman, so you believe in Jesus, don't you? And she said, oh, yes, I believe in Jesus. I try to follow him every day. And I said, all right, now you know what the scripture says. The scripture says that Jesus cast out demons. And so we're going to pray. And so I began a prayer that went something like this. Gracious and loving God, we know you are always listening to us. We ask you now in the name of Jesus, this demon be gone. Leave this woman and do not return. We pray this in the confidence and hope and the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I just have to tell you, I felt a little foolish because there I am, this sophisticated uh, church, and I'm sitting there casting out a demon on the telephone. I could hear through the telephone her, her body relax. I could tell from her breathing that something had changed. I said, are you still there? And she said, yes, thank you. And then she hung up. The end of the story is she never called again. She had made it a habit of calling desperate for help and no one had given it to her. And God allowed me to be a conduit to do something I had never done before, had no, had no belief that I could actually do that God by God's power did. That's what it means to follow the liberator, Jesus, who gives us words when we don't know what to say, who gives us silence when we know we need to shut up, who by the power of prayer answers the needs of others through us. So when Jesus, I mean, I can just see Jesus. He's just had this ecstatic experience up on the mountain. Peter, James, and John don't get it. They won't understand it until later after the resurrection. And then they go, oh, that was what that was about. Here comes Jesus down. He sees this squabbling. He sees a hurting child and a pain-filled father. And he goes, how much longer? He's frustrated with him. I love this human aspect of Jesus. Jesus is the son of God, but he's also a human being and he gets frustrated just like you do. Sometimes you just want to go, how long do I have to tell you this, right? Whoever it is you have to tell to, your children, your husband, your husband, your children, <laughs> the dog, your preacher, right? The preacher telling the people. Well, we all have to be told it until we get it. And the way that we get it is by praying. Not so that God gets it, because God already has it, right? We pray so we will get it. We pray so that we... So the disciples forgot the very first principle of being a faithful follower of God. That in all things, you start with prayer. The first thing you do is you say, thank you, God. I was able to wake up this morning, put my feet on the ground, and thank you, the coffee pot worked. Thank you, God. We thank you, God. Now, the Father says, I believe, help me with my doubts. So the question is, what is belief, what is faith, what is trust, and what is doubt? 
I, I want to suggest that we believe in God. Sometimes we don't believe God. God has given us many things in the living word of Jesus. God has given us the promise of presence and of power, of comfort and strength and encouragement. My, one of my favorites is God promises that in the Holy Spirit, we will be provoked to do good. I'm going to provoke all of you to do good. That's what the Holy Spirit says. Doubt is like lament. Go back and look at some Psalms, 150 Psalms, about a, a quarter to a third of them are Psalms that are either entirely or a great portion of them are Psalms of lament. What is lament? Lament is complaint. Where does complaint come from? Doubt. I go, woe is me, God. Where are you? I, I don't know where you are. That's lament. Well, it's the same thing as doubt. Because I'm saying, I doubt, God, that you're here with me. Now, you can only say that you doubt that God is with you when you know that God has been with you. And you hold on to whatever it is that you can hold on to that you, you know that it is true. That's why the man says, help me in my unbelief. To doubt means that you do have faith. To doubt means that you question, and God is not afraid of our questioning. God is not afraid of our questioning. God is not afraid of our lament. God can handle it. God can handle our grief. In the pandemic, one of the terrible things that has happened is that we have not been able to grieve together. This may be one of the, the worst things that this pandemic has done to us because some people would not face reality that we had a true global pandemic. More people died than needed to. So I'm gonna give you a little reminder, put on your mask, wash your hands, keep six feet apart because, just a minute. The life you say may be somebody's grandmother. This is my six foot pool noodle. You see what it is? It's, it's two pool noodles taped together, duct tape, to show how far six feet is. So in my office, when somebody's in here, I can show them that they can sit there and we're six feet apart. I went in our sanctuary and I measured where we'd have to sit. I thought, oh, good grief, right? Why do we do that? Not because we doubt that God would protect us, but because we trust that God will protect us when we do what God expects us to do. So Jesus comes down and he says, boys, why do you keep missing the obvious? I just love to pick on the boys because then I realized that we're all just like them aren't we? We act like we know, we act like we believe everything that we say we believe, but then we go on and we go our merry way and, and act like that what we say we believe doesn't really matter. The best part of the story is that the little boy gets healed. He gets, he gets healed. That's, that's a good part of the story. But the, but the other good part of the story, I think might be that years that go by, the father tells the boy the story. And I have, I have this um, idea that the boy grows up. So in my mind, he's about four or five years old. That's about how old I think he is. And, and um, when he's 12, he goes to Jerusalem, right? For Passover because he's had his bar mitzvah and now he's a man right and he's there and he goes to the temple and um so this is this is about four years after Jesus's death and resurrection and he goes to the temple 
and he sees all the people who are there praying. He goes through the court of the Gentiles. He goes through the court where the women are, and he goes into the real place, you know, where the men are. And he sees the groups of men. He sees some that he can identify. Those are the Pharisees because they have on Pharisaic things, and they're the Sadducees. And he sees this other group. And this other group is clearly a little different than, than the others. And he goes over and he's listening in and he hears them say something about Jesus. Can you picture it? And he, and he gets up closer and he's listening with his 12 year old ears and he hears them saying, and we praise you God because the Christian Jewish Christians are praising God as they always do using the Psalms, giving thanks, praying, but they're talking about Jesus. And the little boy, after they say, amen, amen, asks one of them, who are you talking about? Who is this Jesus you're talking about? And one of the disciples is pleased to turn to explain. We're telling you, and go, go to Acts and read, read any of that passage in Acts where Peter's given the sermon or Philip or any of them. They tell him the bare facts. There was this Jesus. He was a healer and teacher. And the little boy says, oh. I know who he is. He's the one who healed me. Isn't that great? These are stories about real people who keep on going, who are able to have lives because Jesus healed them. Now, you are that disciple. You are that disciple. Zoe was telling me before everybody came back on about teaching preschool. Do you have that? Do you have that thing handy? You could show everybody again. She was telling that, that last Sunday the Sunday school lesson was about the uh, about the boy, the, the the paralyzed guys. Look at this. Is this not the coolest thing? Can y'all see that? Zoe, say something so you get bigger. <laughs> Should be on on speaker there. Yeah, it's it's one of those things you put together and see there are the friends on top of the roof. And if, if, if I can work it and hold it. Yeah. And, and it's in its book. There's strings on the, on, see there? And the, and the friends on the roof let the, the, the paralyzed man down and they get, they, and they get, there he is by Jesus. Now tell them, Zoe, what you told me about your preschool. Four or five. We started preschool on Zoom uh, almost a year ago, accidentally. And uh, we've just kept it going. And I have more actually zoomed in than in person now that we're back in, you know, sort of pseudo Sunday school class. But um, the children, I was focused on Jesus and the paralyzed man. The children were focused on the neighbors, on the friends, and, and how amazed they were that they were so determined to crawl up on the roof and tear the roof apart. But that was their focus on being the friend. There you go. So a disciple is a friend to someone who needs a friend. The, the father brought his own child, but sometimes the children of various ages need someone else to bring them. Do you know what the largest group of unevangelized people in Arkansas is? What age cohort is the largest evangelized group? Where's my hot springs village person? Where's the village person? Uh, Carol, Carol. Carol, where'd Carol go? She's hiding from me. Carol. Well, I was gonna pick on, I don't see. The largest cohort of unevangelized people in the United, in Arkansas, is people over 65. Children over 65 don't know about the healing salvific power of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? What that means is if you in your social location tend to relate to people who are like you in your social location, you who are over 65 are the evangelists that we most need right now in Arkansas. Isn't that interesting? That means that you might be the very people who need to prayerfully 
heal those who are in the throes of the seizures of their lives that keep them from living full and abundant lives. Does that make you feel powerful? You should, you should feel very powerful. And, and if you are younger than 65, you also are people who have an incredible opportunity to pray so that God can use you to bring other people into wholeness. Pam? And, yes? May I add something to that? Please. Um, it's Vicki again. I swore I wasn't going to do this again, but. Oh, you uh, have always good participation. This past year, I lost both of my parents. Now, my dad was 97 and my mom was um, 95. And um, dad was short of 97, mom was 95. And they had been in an assisted living for five years. And I found that even though my time was being split basically between work and sitting with them and sometimes some things at church, but really nowhere else, that I found that my ministry was with those people inside the assisted living. Mm -hmm. Now, my dad died two weeks after COVID shut down the assisted living. Neither one of them died of COVID, mm -hmm. but the center was shut down. But because we had been, me and my two brothers had been caregivers for them, we were allowed in. Oh. I found myself being the one and only person from outside that these people saw. And I found, and, and now that my parents are gone and I have not been able to be back into the center, um, I still try to stay um, in contact with those that I knew there. Now, many of them are gone for this reason or that reason. Some have died, some have moved on. But I, I find that that is a huge, what you're saying is just huge. And we can't let these people feel more alone than they already do. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. My daddy died June 11th uh, at home in the bed with mother. Um, they were on their way to their 71st wedding anniversary, I think. We were able to have a service at the church with just family. And then it was Zoomed, uh, streamed elsewhere. But the thing that we notice about this grief is it's just not the same to be able to share it in that way. Because I mentioned bereavement meals. That's one of the important things that the church does in grieving is that you allow people to sit at the table together. And um, it, is, it is healing for those who have had the, the death, but it's also healing for the others in the community of faith who knew that person. Um, so yes, let's take Vicky's Vicky's uh, comment to heart. They tell us that shut-ins who do have limited contact contact are 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 just falling apart, and they they don't eat and then they die, and it's just a simple matter of 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 being present to them. Then extrapolate that on out, sister, that there are people in our world who are isolated, even though they may not look like they're isolated. That what we, what we could pray for is for God to help us be prayerfully aware of who isn't all right, who says they're all right. You, you, you follow me here? Um, up there in Northwest Arkansas, Dawn Spraggs is uh, one of our deacons. And she's at your church, isn't she, Kathy? Are you? Yeah. And she works in a mental health center for, for youth. The needs of youth there has tripled. The needs of, of suicidal youth. There aren't any beds left in the mental hospitals for them to, to be 
place where they most need to be, where they can be safest. Um, we, we desperately need to pray so that we may respond beyond prayer in ways that we can. We can't all do everything, but, and I don't, and I can't explain to you how the prayer works, but I know it does. All right. We do, we pray grateful for God's grace with us and grateful that we can ask for God's grace with others. And um, that's what happens in this story is that a little boy's father is confident enough and, and um, assertive enough to say, you, I, I need you to do something for my child. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if our hearts would break with that kind of passion for everybody's child so that we would care about children who don't have anybody else to care for. That we could, we could love into wholeness people who, who most need what we have. That's what it means to be evangelical. To be an evangelical means to receive the commission from the one who has chose us before the foundation of the world and to accept the commission to be sent to where we are. Wesley gives us this covenant prayer. It says, put me to doing, put me to not doing. Well, there's no such thing as not doing. What, what, what John Wesley meant by that was, I don't always have to be up on the horse going somewhere. Sometimes I need to be where I am and be so wholly present there that I can really be present to the power of God speaking to me to know how I need to be here in this moment now. Okay, so, wow, y'all are good. Y'all are good, you're good people. So we get to Mark and I wanna tell you something else about the wonderful gospel of Mark. The gospel of Mark uses the word immediately in the new RSV uses the word immediate. The gospel of Mark is a short gospel that has an intense purpose. The purpose is to tell you what the good news about Jesus is. It presumes from the very beginning all the way to the end that Jesus is who Jesus says he is. Jesus is all the things that you said at the beginning of our time together. Jesus is a compassionate, caring, courageous, empathetic person who teaches sometimes in ways that are hard to understand, but who heals people, who confronts authorities, who does what needs to be done. And then at the end, after 27 immediately, immediately this happened, immediately this happens, the action slows and we go to Jerusalem and Jesus stays on the cross. Jesus willingly goes to the cross and stays there. Jesus had the power not to go there. At any point in the, in the last week, he could have done something else, but he chooses to do what needs to be done. And after his body is taken down off of the cross and Joseph of Arimathea, a highly respected member of the Jewish council has gotten permission to take the body and Pilate is surprised because usually it takes longer for crucified people to die than this short amount of time. And usually people who were crucified, and I say people because it was not just men, women too were crucified. The crucifiers would break their legs so that they would die more quickly because if you don't, if your legs are broken, you can't push up to keep your your lungs from collapsing because you really usually suffocate on the cross. So Pilate is, is assured that yes, this Jesus of Nazareth is dead, gives Joseph the permission. And we come to this ending in Mark, which is different than the other synoptics. Now in your Bible, if you'll turn to, to Mark 16, verses one to eight, you will discover that there's a verse nine after verse eight. And you're going to say, Pastor Tim, uh, what's the deal here? You're going to notice that in verse nine, there probably should be a little bracket. 
little bracket, right? And maybe you have a footnote and down at the footnote, it'll say these verses not included in all manuscripts or most the most ancient manuscripts don't include these verses. <clears throat> now that's textual criticism that we would appeal to our theological roots for. And we would say, when you study manuscripts, you try to figure out which one is the oldest and you look and you say, oh, well, that probably is the oldest. And then you find another one that's almost identical except it has these extra verses. And then you go back to remember what I said at the beginning and you wondered why I made such a big deal about it. And here's why. In the synoptics, the three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there is an ending where something happens after the women are at the tomb. And in John too, don't you just love John? I come to the garden alone, right? Mary Magdalene. But Mark in the most ancient copies that we think that are the most ancient, the story ends at eight. So what I want you to do now, I, I want you to unlearn what you've always known about how the story ends, okay? So you just take all that out and hear just exactly what the most ancient manuscript probably said, translated into English, which is not what we usually have because if we were with Jesus, it would have been in Aramaic or Greek. And here's what 16 says. And when the Sabbath had passed, which would have been Saturday night, after the sunset, when it was dark enough that you could no longer tell who was who around you. That's how you know Sabbath is over. Mary the Magdalene and James Mary and Salome purchased spices so they might come and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the Sabbath week, that is the days after the Sabbath, they come to the tomb as the sun is rising. And they said to one another, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? And looking up, they see that the stone has been rolled back, for it was extremely large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting in the, to the right, clothed in a white robe, and they were amazed. But the young man said to them, do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who has been crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he precedes you into Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. And going out, they fled from the tomb for trembling and bewilderment had taken hold of them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. The end. The end. Now, you remember that boy I told you about who, who had his bar mitzvah and he went to the temple and he's 12 years old and they tell him about Jesus and they say, you know, you ought to come over and, and to our house meeting. We're having, we're having church at a house and we're going to have, we're going to have something to eat and there always is plenty to eat. So you come on over. Now, the gospel of Mark probably wasn't written down until about uh, AD 60, 70, somewhere, you know, after that. So this part of my storytelling doesn't really work very well, but let's just pretend. And so he goes over to their house and they say, you know, one of the things we do is that we, we tell the stories that we know about Jesus and uh, one of our number has written it down and she's a really good writer. Oh, I forgot to tell you. The gospel of Mark was written by a woman. Did you know that? That was one of the things I was supposed to tell you at the beginning of this Bible study was that one of the things they wanted to do in this Bible study was to just completely freak you out by suggesting to you that the Gospel of Mark was written by a woman. We don't know that. It's, I've, ne I've not ever seen that before I read this textbook. The reason that they did it was because of what just went across your faces. Your faces showed disbelief, surprise, consternation, and some of you said, wow, cool. That'd be all right for a woman to have written the Gospel. Because whenever we confront something that is completely different than what we've ever thought before, those are all the responses we have. We, we sometimes like to be given some new way of looking at things, but often we don't. I'll give you an example. All of you aware of what's gone on this week in the week of Dr. Seuss's birthday? Theodore Jezel, the writer who was known as Dr. Seuss has a foundation, the Dr. Seuss Foundation. It's run by his, 
his uh, descendants and some other people announced on his birthday that they were no longer going to print copies of six of the books that Dr. Seuss had written. And they gave the justification as that it, they had realized that these books um, illustrated ideas and pictures that were not appropriate anymore. And I, if you're on Facebook, you probably, or whatever the social media, you've seen all kinds of responses. I mean, some people are just completely exercised over the fact that somebody would decide to stop publishing the book. They've accused people of censorship and all of this sort of thing. Well, I'm familiar with all of these books. And the one book in particular, uh, If I Ran the Zoo, it's racist. It depicts people in ways that are, that, that are just downright demeaning. And I remember as a child first reading that book thinking, that's a terrible thing. That's a terrible picture pictures of Africans and pictures of Asian, Asians, and it was just a bad book. Now, I will have to confess to you, I'm not really that keen on Dr. Seuss. From the very beginning, when Dr. Seuss first came out, The Cat in the Hat, and we all read it, I, I thought this is a bad book. Because in The Cat in the Hat, what does the cat do? He encourages the children to misbehave while their parents are gone and lie. These are not qualities that I want children to learn in literature. Now, I understand as an educator, however, that Dr. Seuss did a wonderful thing for literacy because the repetition and rhyme of his books and the colorful illustrations did introduce a lot of children to the joys of reading. Okay, fine. Now, the point is, when you first saw this stuff, you had a reaction. You went, oh, oh that's terrible. Or, oh, that's a good thing. Or, oh, I don't know about that, right? you had a reaction because it was something that, that you questioned what you had always accepted. Janet Wolfe and company said, well, let's just imagine that the Gospel of Mark was written by a woman as a way of helping us read it with fresh eyes. Because it is hard to read scripture without always bringing everything you know you know to the scripture. But stay with me. If we were to imagine that the Gospel of Mark was written down the comp compilation of the stories of the people who, who were with Jesus and who experienced the resurrection power, and it was written by a woman, why would the woman end with that line? And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. But now wait, remember, I just told you that we invited our young friend who had previously had epileptic seizures to our meeting and we read this aloud because that's what you did with written documents. Someone read the document in our fellowship. And when, when we got to the very last line, our little friend, the 12 year old is sitting there and he hears them say, they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. What does he, what does he think? What does he feel? What does that line mean now? Well, they must have said something to somebody or we wouldn't have a story. But what does the story do to you if it ends there? The title of this chapter in which we study this scripture is Threatened with Resurrection. Threatened with Resurrection. Believing that Jesus is raised and not dead and that you have been told to do something is a threat to everything that you have previously understood. The resurrection of Jesus is a threat to the status quo because it proves that God is greater than what we could have imagined God could be. That not only does Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, but that God raises Jesus from the dead and gives us a kind of life which is beyond the controls of our social locations, which are limitations, and instead pushes us to possibilities where everyone is included, where if there are 
there are people who are out so off, not sitting at the table, we figure out a way to make the table bigger. When my, when my sister and my brother got married, my parents, the table was big enough for, for the five of us to sit with one extra guest, right? Well, then when they got married, we needed a room for two more. So we got another leaf and we put another leaf in the table and we pushed the table wider and we brought some other chairs in. And then we kept bringing all these other people to the, to the table. And it used to be that we would sit at the table, which was really designed for about six or eight people with 12 or 14 people. Finally, my parents added onto their house. They knocked out the wall and almost doubled the size of the house and daddy special ordered a table that 18 people can sit comfortably at. But you know what? The last time I was there when there was a crowd at all, we still had to go get the card table and put it at the end of the table and then cover it with the um, tablecloth. So it looked like it was just one big table and we still were all sitting tightly. And that was the day we buried, we, we, we celebrated my daddy's life. We made the table big enough for everybody who needed to be there, who could be there to sit there at the table and we ate. And we all said, well, he wants us to have dessert. How many desserts are we going to have? <laughs> because that's what the end of the story tells us, is that the end of the story is not the end of the story. This is a more satisfactory end because it brings you into what can't be the end of the story. But it recognizes that you are going to be afraid. You and I should be afraid because to live fully into the power of Jesus, the liberator, means that we have to say no to the powers of evil. It means that we have to resist people who lie about the good of others. It means we have to say to ourselves, oh, that was a biased thought. That was a biased expression of opinion. Why did you say that? Do you really believe that? And when we question these things, then it means we have to make a decision about what we're going to do. We can't just say, well, the kid's flailing around. You know, it's probably somebody's fault that he, that he can't read when he's in the third grade. You know, there's probably sin in his home because they don't do right. No, that won't work, will it? Are you following me? Are you feeling bad? Are you feeling, are you feeling uh, that you really ought to be more than you've been, because that's really what the liberating power of the good news is supposed to be, is supposed to provoke us out of our inaction to thinking, what can we do? In the pandemic, we are limited by what we can do, but everybody can pick up the telephone. And if you're uncomfortable phoning, you can still text. And, you know, crazy as Facebook is, you can put something on Facebook. Now I'm going to go back to the question I asked you before lunch, which was, how can you practice amazement? The interesting thing to me about this book is that it suggests, this textbook we had, is that it suggested to us that one of the things the Gospel of Mark does is that it invites us into a place where we say, wow, that's what God is doing. Anne Lamont, the theolo theologian, says, you know, there are really only, only three prayers. Wow, thank you, and help. Most of the time, our intercessory prayer groups, we go, help, help, help. Sometimes when the help has been answered, we say, thank you. But what if we did more wow? What if we do more wow? I'm, I'm going to turn around here, and I can look out the, the back. You see there's a door there? And there's this, it goes out into a little courtyard. And I was here for about, I don't know, four or five months before I even went out that door to see where it went. And there, there are little trees in pots. I don't know why they put little trees in pots there, but they did. And then you go around to the left and you can wind around and you can come out behind the, the church. But the interesting thing is that if you don't just walk out and go a different way so you don't have to go out the front so that you can sneak out because pastors do that sometimes. What I see is this incredible variety of stuff. And when I walk Dolly out, she says, wait a minute, I smell something interesting. Let me go check this out. 
to be amazed. I stand amazed in the presence, right? I walk amazed in the presence. I, I look at an apple. Don't you just love apples, right? Right? The apple, what an incredible thing. And somebody put stickers on every last one of these apples so that I can buy it individually at the grocery store. Isn't it incredible? Thank you, God, for the person who put this sticker on. Thank you, God, for the person who picked this and packed this and unpacked it. Thank you, God, for the, look at this. It's a Granny Smith apple. It's not native to our country. It's my favorite apple. Now, if I had a sharp knife, I could do something that would wow and amaze you. You know what I would do, right? I would cut it. Not this way, not, not down the stem to make wedges. I would cut straight through its little milk. And you know what would be inside? Do you all know? Do you know? There's a star in there. That's amazing. Why did God put a star inside an apple? Why not? When we are amazed, it makes us, we're filled with gratitude to God, aren't we? And when we're filled with gratitude to God, we then want other people to enter into that same kind of place with gratitude. We want other people to know the secrets that there are stars inside apples. Now, the other fun thing is, how many apples are in this apple? Did you ever think about it that way? How many apples are in this apple, Judy? Because there are seeds in the apple and every seed is the potential of another tree and the other, the tree, not immediately, it'll take a while, can grow another tree. How many apples are in what apple? And the kingdom of God is likened to this, an apple in which there is a star. And you, my dear friends, who have been willing to stay here with me as I have gone wacky crazy over how the gospel of Mark is a gospel short, but powerful. It calls us to immediacy. That calls us to be amazed, to be filled with wonder that God in such great love made everything in the world and said it's good and gave it to us for us to care for and gives us the care of all these wonderful people around us the care of the elderly and the middle-aged and the young and teenagers and four-legged critters and two-legged critters and even snakes. God has given it all to us for us to be in wondrous amazement. And that is the answer to the second question I ask you. How do you resist evil? You resist evil by living into the power of the liberating Jesus who has come so that all who believe should have life now and forever so that the whole world may be the way God wants it to be, a place where every person is valued, regardless of social location, where every life matters, where a child after birth is cared for with the same kind of love as any other child a place that is impossible, yet is possible in spite of my doubts of its possibility, a place where we do not allow hatred, a place where we don't let hatred win, a place where we allow the love and power of God to dispel hatred. And we ask God, Dispel that hatred in me, the hatred I have of myself for who I am not when I want to be who I should be, to accept the forgiveness of God so that I can be who God has made me to be. We pray with one another, confident that when we can touch hands, <laughs> that we will hold our hands together and we will be in community making the world be a place that others say it can't be because we trust that the God who promised will fulfill, that the God who acts will continue to act in us, 
and it may not happen immediately. It may not happen immediately as it did in the gospel, but it will surely happen because Jesus said it would. So I leave you with this word. Be provoked. Be agitated. Let the power of God help you question what you are certain of. Do not be certain of anything except this, that God's love is for you and for all God's children and for all the world. Be certain of this, Jesus is Lord. And until that time when all is as God knows it can be, may we live in the fullness of that power and grace, amazed by the love we share with one another and with God. Go in peace and be in peace. Be radical. Amen. And now I leave you. Thank you so much, Pastor Pam. Let's, we can't, she won't hear us clapping. You can show your thumbs up for what she's done. It has been an absolutely wonderful session. You left us all with things to think about and, and, and ponder and try to be better Christians than we have been in the past. Thank you all for staying today. It has been, I think, a wonderful, wonderful study. I hope you um, feel you have accomplished something and that, that this has been a worthwhile experience. Thank you all for registering. Anyone have anything that you want to make an announcement? Uh, about something going on in your district or something before we all leave. And by the way, we have given an honorarium um, as Pastor Pam requested uh, the organization 200,000 reasons for her doing our uh, presentation today. And we thank her again for what she has done. So have a great weekend. Enjoy the rest of the sunshine today and uh, see you at our next Zoom, I guess. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you for inviting Bye. all of us. Oh, we're